Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to tonight's meeting of George's River Council. Uh, I declare the meeting open at 7.02 p.m. Could we all stand for the national anthem, please? <laughs> Australians all let us rejoice for we are one and free. We've golden soil and wealth for toil. Our home is God by sea. Our land abounds in nature's gifts of beauty. standing and uh, Councillor Green lead us in prayer. We yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for that morning, Councillor Catrus. Councillors, we gather here tonight and ask our Lord's blessing on all the deliberations and discussions we have on behalf of our local community. In doing so, we also remember those who will be announced tonight as having passed away in the last month. We remember their contributions to the local community. We also, of course, recognise that there are many in our community who are suffering from a variety of, uh, of issues and causes, and we hope, particularly those who are suffering health issues, they are able to deal with those successfully. We, of course, also recognise those who are suffering in conflicts overseas, uh, particularly those in the Ukraine. We ask, Lord, that you take all these things into your into our prayers this evening. Amen. Thank you, Councillor. Um, the acknowledgement of country is that the Council acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which this meeting is being held as the political people of the Old Nations, and we pay uh, our respects to their elders past and present. And emerge. Thank you, councillors. We, I believe, we have a full contingent of councillors, so there's no, there are no apologies. Um, staff and public are reminded this meeting is being recorded for mi minute-taking purposes and is also being webcast live on council's website. This recording will be made available on council's website. The order of business is as as shown in the agenda. Uh, the code of meeting practice prohibits the electronic recording of meetings without the express permission of council. And we do have some disclosures of interest. Um, the disclosures of interest are as follows. Council on Mali, CCL 051-22, application pursuant to council ward discretionary funds. Um, excuse me. He is a member of OT4 and Board, a conservation society, which is subject of an application under the policy. It's a non-significant, non-pecuniary. Again, Councillor Marnie, um, again, the same item. Again, his principal of a residence, uh, a residence is adjacent, his principal place of residence is adjacent to the government-owned land, which could in the future be classified 
as a wildlife protection area, non-significant, non-pecuniary, council money, uh, uh, notice of motion 55-22, uh, investigations of the environmental and financial and other impacts of synthetic fields. He's a member of OP4 and Fauna, which has uh, researched this matter and brought into my attention. He had also assisted with soil sampling at Fulton Park, non-significant, non-pecuniary, Council Amani, CCL 046-22, uh, report of the Finance and Governance Committee. Um, he, is he is acquainted with, a business, with business owners who may derive a benefit from this proposal, non-significant, non-pecuniary. Do we have any further disclosures of interest? Okay. Um, public participation on items on the agenda. Tonight we have 12 speakers registered for tonight's meeting. I would remind the speakers that speakers have a three minute time limit. Speakers are subject to the provisions of the Council Code of Conduct when addressing the meeting. The first sound you hear indicates that you have one minute remaining. At the second sound, please conclude your comments. I will have to be fairly strict on that because we've got 12 speakers. So please understand. Uh, okay. Um, now the first speaker. After this, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks. Bye. Okay. All right. <laughs> the first speaker is Matthew Pappas, who's going to address us remotely on notice of motion 50-22, deferred report uh, on the Peters Park sporting amenities. <laughs> Mr. Matthew Pappas, are you there? Are you there? <coughs> are you there? Phone number after this. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks. Bye. Oh, okay. Mr. Pappas, are you there? No. Oh well, I, I think we go to the next one. Miss Fiona Brotherham remotely uh, regarding Hogman Park lighting solution. Hello, Matthew Pater speaking. I won't say. Um, yes, Mr. Patters, could you please address us? You've got two. You've got yes, three minutes. No worries. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, councillors, for your time. Um, my name is Matthew Pappas, and I'm the president at Picos United Football Club. Um, again, thank you for allowing me to speak in support of the notice, notice of motion for um, the extension of our existing amenities to include female change rooms at Picos Park. Um, Picos United Football Club has been part of the local community, community since 1965 and has had thousands of players over those many years. In recent years, the club has grown significantly to be 400 registered players of 2022, up from 200 only four years ago. Our current amenities include a canteen and two storerooms with toilets only. This, this amenities block was built back in 2016 by Essel City Council at a time when we were only 200 players. We have now grown to have approximately 40% of our players being female, up from one team that we had in 2016. And these players have no safe place to get changed before or after the game. As well as our female play players, our male players, both junior and senior, also do not have access to change rooms. We are the last remaining football club in the area without a change room. And if this project was undertaken, it would mean that all football clubs within the St George, uh, the George River Council area would have a change room and it would be a legacy item for the council. As a club, we are requesting the council approve this notice motion to undertake plans and costings and apply for state and or federal government grants to undertake this important project that will allow our growing club to keep up with the facility standards of neighbouring football clubs to maintain and attract players to our club. Um, thank you for your time. Um, that's the end of my speech. Thank you, Mr. Pappas. Uh, thank you so to, much. Thank you. Uh, we now go thank to you. Ms. Fiona Brodlum, and it has to do with Hogman Park Fiona. lighting solution. Ms. Brodlum, Ms. Brodlum. Uh, 
Are you there? Yes, hello. Yeah, please address the council. Thank you. Hi, good evening, councillors. Um, Mr Mayor, councillors and staff, thank you for your time this evening. Uh, my name is Fiona Pedromu and I am a long-time resident of the Cochra Bay Ward. I would like to voice my support for tonight's motion on the agenda to investigate lighting within Hogburn Park to facilitate the use of the full-size basketball court post-dusk, specifically during the winter months of the year. For those unfamiliar with Hogburn Park, it is situated in close proximity to Cogra Railway Station and is bound by the railway line, railway parade and Harrow Road. The park incorporates children's play equipment, toilets, seating, a shelter, public art and a full-size basketball court. The court is centrally located within the park, is approximately 40 metres from the footpath in Railway Parade and given the topography of the park, which slopes down towards the railway corridor, the existing level of the court itself is four metres lower than the public footpath and railway parade. Numerous large jacaranda trees are scattered along the roof tree of the park, with a number of other mature and large trees within the park itself. Four-storey high-density residential flat buildings are positioned opposite railway parade, roughly 50 metres from the closest part of the court in an elevated position. My family and I regularly frequent Hogburn Park. The children use the play equipment and the husband plays basketball, as do a substantial number of other local residents. Each time we visit on an afternoon, there are a significant number of users gathering to enjoy the park in various ways. With regards to the basketball court, users are predominantly male and range in age from 10 to well into their 50s. Residents play well together, some bring speakers, and the music played contributes to a fun atmosphere and environment. The court facilitates a positive community spirit. Users of the court would appreciate being able to utilise this facility following sunset during the winter months of the year, given the sun sets earlier during winter, generally by five. By the time users finish work, school, extracurricular activities and the like, it is too dark to make use of the court. At the moment, while solar lights are located within the park, they do not generate sufficient levels of illumination, nor are located so as to enable the safe use of the court. As noted in the agenda, this request is consistent with the relevant council documents, uh, and it was also raised during consultation of the Hogman Park Master Plan in 2010, which was quite some time ago. I thoroughly support the motion before you tonight and hope it will be considered favourably for the benefit of the local community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. President. You as a uh, Cogra Bay councillor, I must say your points are well put and well taken. Um, I you, now Andre. go to Dr. Scott Wilson and he will be addressing us remotely on the investigation into environmental, financial and other impacts of synthetic fields. Dr. Wilson, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh, you can address your ca the council. Thank you. Uh, yes, so uh, my name's uh, Dr. Scott Wilson. I'm a, the chief scientist at the Earthwatch Institute and also uh, research director of the Australian Microplastic Assessment Project. Uh, we've been, or I personally have been researching uh, the issue of microplastics uh, around Australia for the last five years or so. Uh, and unfortunately what we're seeing is a growth in the amounts and types of microplastics. So microplastics are those small items of big stuff that breaks up, but it's also uh, those other things uh, like synthetic grass and also uh, rubber crumb. So the rubber that's in the sports field, the synthetic sports fields, we're seeing a growth uh, in our beaches and our shorelines around uh, the Sydney region uh, in both the artificial grass turf and the rubber that is kind of the, the infill for that field. So because many councils around the region have installed uh, these fields, we're seeing a growth in that. And what that means is uh, they're washing off and anywhere we, and we've been sampling uh, both on the beaches, but also near the fields and in conjunction with Gopley, Florida and Florida, 
uh, Society. We've been doing some work uh, within the Georges River Council area and find that there's an issue um, with some of the fields uh, in your jurisdiction. So uh, the issue with the whole microplastics is once it gets into the waterways, it's and so small that it's prone to being ingested by a whole range of uh, organisms, um, not just marine, but freshwater life, um, and also in, in the soil as well, the, the earthworms and the like. <clears throat> so there's a, a range of issues. Um, I support the, the motion put forward uh, for an investigation into looking at the impacts um, and also implementing some measures that are going to prevent that rubber and the grass coming off the field. So uh, I'd encourage the council con to consider that. Um, and if there's any questions, I'm open to those right now. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Um, uh, uh, we now go on to Dr. Gary Hoosley, again on the same item, investigation into environmental, financial and other impacts of synthetic pills. Dr. Hoosley, are you there? Hello. Yeah, hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah, very well. By all means, address the council. <laughs> all righty. Right. Um, so look, Tav, thank you very much for the opportunity to um, speak to the motion. Uh, regarding and investigate the impact um, of uh, synthetic playing fields. I'd like to give some background. My name is uh, Gary Housley. I'm a resident of Connells Point Road, 173 Connells Point Road. I've got a, a background with regard to degrees in zoology and physiology. But I'm really uh, calling to the day, you know, as, a, as a resident of the community, just to um, support the motion uh, and uh, I guess encourage the, the council members to give some thought to the opportunity to uh, implement some mitigation around the um, loss of the uh, you know, the substrates of that synthetic cane field and pulling part uh, into the environment, specifically that um, stream area. So uh, I'm very familiar with the space. Um, I'm walking down there most mornings, and, and again, look, I'd just like to say that I'm, I'm highly supportive of those fields. I've seen the transition and activity that uh, that investment's brought. I mean, uh, I see um, you know, young families uh, down there early in the morning. It's, it's a great environment for the team, and of course, you know, it's, it's uh, really is an answer to uh, you know, all the rain we've been having lately in terms of uh, providing as a broader all weather capability. So I think it's a great resource, but uh, it's also a fantastic environment down there. The council's invested in that uh, Southern Eco Park domain uh, and uh, the stream in the past and the planting around that space. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, pretty clear um, that uh, you know, there are some perhaps engineering challenges with regard to uh, loss into the, into the stream area. Uh, and that stream, in, in, in my opinion and experience, with my background, are uh, pretty clearly struggling uh, in a broader sense. And uh, you know, for that is you know, uh, typically the lack of invertebrates. So, uh, anyway, look, uh, that's, that's my view, and uh, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to um, you know, uh, present that uh, to, to uh, our council. Thank you, Dr. Helsley. Uh, we now go to Mr. Tom Messenger. Um, he will be addressing us remotely and he will be addressing us working together for a better future, the 2022 to 2026 delivery program and operational plan. Um, Mr. Messenger, are you there? Yes, good evening, Mr. Mayor. I will make um, address the council. Thank you. And thank you, Mayor and Councillors, for the opportunity to address you this evening. Uh, I'm a solicitor that acts for Beverly Park Golf Club. Um, I'm instructed to make a submission on behalf of the club in support of the officer's recommendation in item 54 in relation to the 2022 to 2026 delivery program and the 2022-2023 operational plan and updated resources strategy. 
Uh, I confirm that the club has made budget submissions to council seeking funding for the following projects at the golf course. Uh, number one, essential stormwater channel safety and maintenance works. Number two, approved course maintenance and staff amenity shed. And number three, the approved perimeter security fence. I'm instructed to thank the council for including the funding for the essential stormwater channel works in the 2022-2023 budget and for including the maintenance shed and perimeter security fence in the five-year delivery program. I am further instructed to speak in support of the officer's recommendation and commend the recommendation to all councillors. These projects form part of the club's long-term vision for the course, ensuring the ongoing sustainability of council's assets and continuing the 80-year stewardship of the land, maintaining its place as a premier recreation facility in the local community. I note that the shed and the security fence have earlier been determined by the consent authority to be in the public interest for the purposes of the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act. Whilst the president and the general manager of the club are regular attendees during committee meetings, they're available at any time to any councillor to discuss the vision of the board and the members. I thank the council for the opportunity to address you this evening. Thank you, Mr. Messenger. Uh, we now go to Mr. James Farrell, who's going to address us in person. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. And that's the same item as the previous speaker. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors, for the opportunity to speak to you today. I want to bring to your attention a request for an addition to the 2020-2023 operational plan to rectify an injustice that my family and I have been dealing for, with for a number of years. I understand that this issue has been caused by no one working at the Council today, but will lead to us as a family being in financial ruin without your assistance. My wife and I have been in the area for a bit over 20 years and bought a property in Mortdale in May 2006. Our plan was to use all our money to buy the property and then look to uh, put a new home on it um, because the old one had an old fibro 80 year old um, cottage that's falling down. I understand that your usual view is buy but buy beware, but unless you do the usual checks. But please understand that we did everything and more. As part of the search we, of 25 Princess Street, we inspected the property inside out, walked the streets and took note of the drains. Obtained one four nine certificate from this council, a professional surveyor certificate for the property, and a DA was already approved by this council for a new double storey home at the time of purchase. All with no mention that there was a stormwater pipe traversing through the property. I ask you sincerely, what else can anyone do? It would be a complete injustice to take the view by beware when someone has done all the necessary checks and more and be let down by their local council. We would find out later on that the pipe was only there because our neighbour's driveway began to sink and on inspection by the council we discovered that there was a stormwater pipe that went from Park Street through five properties and Prince Street. We were told by council at the time that this wouldn't affect us from building later and when we did go to build, the builder was told to submit a suit via CDC and not to worry. But during that time when the plans were being prepared and all the flood risk rules changed um, within all the local councils, which meant that we had to submit by DA and were informed by council that we could no longer build over the pipe, wasting a further $50,000 on building plans and reports, uh, which I've now lost my deposit. In this case, the council has been completely done, has completely done the wrong thing and now has a family on the brink of financial ruin because of the negligence. Our property is now worthless as I can't build on it. We have an 80, 80 year old home that's, that's falling apart and full of asbestos and a health hazard. If I was to give up and sell, I'm liable to tell whoever's the buyer that the pipe is there and I'll lose well over half a million dollars in the property value. This would be great injustice and morally apprehensible if the council was not to do the right thing and build a pipe along Park Street where it should have been in the first place or acquire the property for falsely informing buyers about the situation. The pipe is well over 90 years old now and falling apart and rather than remediating something that's already dilapidated, do the right thing and convey your constituents, constituents and save your family from ruin. Thanks for your time and I hope you can see why the need to fix um, this is it should be added to the budget. I've given you all a, a copy of the 149, the surveys to be, and the DA that was approved by council. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. 
Um, we will now go to Ms. Ilkna Bayan, who's going, Bayani, who's going to address it in person and also speak on the same subject, working together for better future, 2022-2026 uh, delivery program, etc. Thank you. Uh, dear General Manager, dear Mayor and dear Councillors, firstly I would like to congratulate all the Councillors on their new term as Councillors and extend a very warm welcome to our new Councillors and the new General Manager. Secondly, I will continue with a very personal note. I'm very excited to be here in person. I'm feeling the sense of belonging. It's an honour and privilege to be able to address the Council in person after a long period of COVID restrictions. We now feel that as residents, we are part of the decision-making process for the Georges River Council community. When we voice our opinions and wishes, we're hoping that our Council will listen to us. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today in relation to the amendments that have been made to the Council's operational plan for 2022-2023. The existing councillors and some of the um, new councillors will remember me as I have addressed the council on many occasions in relation to Cars Park Pool since the end of 2018. We all know that it all started with a big promise in April 2018. Having seen the need since the Cardinal report was re received in 2016, the councillors unanimously resolved to build the new aquatic centre. Since then, over 10,000 residents signed a petition to have Cars Park Pool rebuilt on the existing site. Tonight, I would like to express my gratitude to the Council on behalf of myself and on behalf of over 10,000 signatories who are waiting for the rebuilding of Cars Park Pool on the existing site for making the amendments to the operational plan to include this very important action, which is accelerate the feasibility study concept plans and business case for building a new aquatic centre at Cars Park so Council can pursue funding sources. Thank you to the management and to the councillors for listening to the community members who have made new submissions in May this year. We all know these projects take a long time to come to fruition. We are patient. We believe that the modern technology will make it possible for a new pool to be rebuilt on the existing site. We look forward to seeing the feasibility studies that are due to be received in September this year. Thank you for listening to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bayari. Um, we now go to Mr. David Botiger. Uh, he's going to address this in person and he'll be addressing us on complying development certificates. Thank you. Sure. Just waiting for my slides to come up. Okay. Good evening. Um, my name is David Bertiger. I'm here to talk about complying development certificates and private certification in the Georges River area. Uh, I'm a former resident of Oatley and I'm going to emphasize that word former because unfortunately, uh, just the best, the next slide, please. <clears throat> this happened. Um, I wish that was a bit larger, but uh, I used to live in the house on the far left there, um, and a developer moved in and built the house next door. <clears throat> this is a developer known to George River as a, somebody who pushes uh, planning legislation uh, or disregards planning legislation. Um, and in this case, he recruited a private certifier to put a complying development certificate through that was full of uh, code breaches. <coughs> uh, where are my slides? Go on. Um, so, thank you. Uh, as a, probably one of the most obvious examples is this pool deck at the back of the house on the, the bottom right. Um, that pool deck was 1.8 metres above ground when the planning legislation quite clearly stipulates that a pool deck can only be 600 millimetres off the ground. So we sought council help for this, um, but ultimately we, we didn't receive much assistance and we were forced to take these, this developer to court. Um, we were able to have that back deck removed and some trees installed along the pool line there to have some to restore some privacy to our backyard. 
but ultimately the the emotional cost of this this procedure was so extreme that we didn't feel comfortable in our own home anymore and we we left um, in January this year. Next slide please. <clears throat> now there are two main reasons why I think this happened. Firstly the private certification system in New South Wales is horribly flawed. Um, developers can link up with any certifier they wish uh, and so of course the dodgy developers are going to link up with the dodgy certifiers. Secondly, certifiers essentially are not disciplined anymore. This is a, a plot of disciplinary action taken against certifiers in the last 20 years, and it shows it's dropping significantly. And in the last two years, there have been two disciplinary decisions handed out to certifiers. Next slide, please. <clears throat> On top of that, there's a, a Georgia Sewer Council policy not to intervene with privately certified developments. This is a response we received from Gail Connolly, which says that uh, whilst council retains a regulatory role with enforcement powers, council will not intervene with private certifiers unless there's a significant risk to human life or safety or significant property damage. And unfortunately, councils had to adopt that stance because of the number of complaints they've received about private certifiers. Now, there are a lot of things wrong with this. Firstly, it implies that private certifiers can do anything they like. As long as it's not dangerous, council won't do anything. Secondly, the compliant development certificate process in parts requires council approval, for example, for tree removal and for stormwater drainage. If, if the certifier doesn't get those approvals, is council not going to do anything? And then finally, it states there that this, this policy is introduced because of the number of complaints received. And yet in the media response to the article a couple of slides ago, council state they don't count the number of complaints they receive. Final slide, please. I think there are two things that council need to be doing. Firstly, they need to be communicating with state government about the impact that private certifiers are having in the Georgia River area. <clears throat> they need to tell them how many complaints they get. They need to <clears throat> they need to tell them stories like mine. And finally, that policy of not intervening with private certifiers needs to change. It's unethical not to do anything about the flawed private certifier system in this area when council has the power to do something. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bergenberg. Um, we'll now, now talk, and uh, will now be addressed by Justin Matthews. Uh, Mr. Mr. Matthews, uh, complying development certificates again. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, councillors. Uh, my story is nowhere near as horrendous as David's, but equally, uh, the certifiers are a pain. Um, we have an experience with a granny flat that went up next door to us um, and our problems actually started prior to the DA when the property was uh, raised illegally and the council did nothing about it. This doesn't happen off the bat. People know what they're doing. They work with the certifiers. They get all the stuff done beforehand. If you go to the next slide, you can show where the property was illegally raised. Council did nothing and there's no remediation whatsoever done. As per David's points. Uh, There's a bit of frustration from local residents because of the inconsistency applied by George River Council with management of the tree policy. Next slide, please. At DA, we raised these issues with the council uh, and there was no remediation or nothing that happened and, and no one even checked the, the slides, the, sorry, the, the, um, the DAs. Next slide, please. As you can see on the next slide, if anyone had bothered to go to Google Maps or Google Earth, or Google, you would have found that this is a single car garage, wouldn't comply with the DA or the CDC if it was uh, to put up. And it, this would seem like a tick and flick exercise from the council when it comes to reviewing the, the DA. Next slide, please. Heritage. Now, an absolute bug there of anyone who lives in the McRae's estate area. This was a complete shocker. This house, is, as you can probably might have to zoom out, or you can see there, the, the house is a contributory item. There's a neutral statement, the heritage impact assessment put up, completely used by council. Now, this is put up by the certifier and, their, um, and the, the developer. And so this is a whole bunch of mistakes we made at 3DA, let alone what happened afterwards. During the construction phase, um, just like Jim, please, um, the granny flat, we had to complain about it, the slab that was too high. And the council did actually step in and, and leave it a fine or a penalty, we understand. That fine or penalty was absolutely insignificant because they kept on going and doing more. If you go two slides on, you probably get to where I'm up to at the moment. Um, there's a subdivision. 
this fence here was not as per the DA, and there's a retaining wall, concrete footpath. Basically, they have skirted all the rules regarding anything to do with hydraulic plans and um, or stormwater management. The council wonders why we have issues. Now, these are completely trivial compared to what David went through, but we did suffer significant water damage throughout the whole of the process, and nothing was done. We were brushed by the certifier and it's basically ignored, and it goes on today. And so we'll see what happens later on. A BIC or a building inspection certificate, next slide please, was um, requested. This is blank, this is empty. Council did not check this before it was sent out. This is what they're relying on. They're relying on the council to do nothing. That was sent out empty. All the illegal works completely ignored. Council is complicit in what goes on. And do I mention the illegal works? So if you go to the next slide, you can see where they plumbed the stormwater to the sewer. These guys are a joke. People have to keep an eye on these guys. And, and council, as David said, has abrogated its responsibility so they don't want to hear about it. At fault, on the last slide, or second last slide, sorry, the owner, the certifier, and the builder, but for not following the DA they submitted, which had factual errors and omissions and illegally erasing the property. The council is also at fault for not taking the, count, the, the owner to the, the shed for the, the raising the property, not placing the trees at a minimum, allowing the DA to go through and the DA with some stakes and emissions, a paltry fine that allowed them to keep on going and, and doing more illegal works and then sending out a pick that was empty. I could go to the last page because no time's out. Council has powers. Under the LEC, you guys can step in and apply and put these guys to the sword and to rip things up. If you start doing this, they'll stop doing it. You guys need to get up and start hitting them where it hurts. Thank you. Thank you, um, We now have Mr. Dennis Kinney in person. Again, uh, not on compliance but on the certificate, just working together for a better future. Uh, the delivery program. Thank you. Mayor and councillors, thank you. I'm speaking mainly in support of uh, James Farrow, who spoke previously. Uh, regarding the stormwater pipe running between Park Street and Princess Street and located under our residence. We purchased our house 53 years ago and constructed an extension shortly afterwards. Prior to purchasing the property, we undertook all appropriate searches and inspections and there was no reference to the presence of a council pipe on the property. We would not have considered buying a house with a stormwater pipe running through the place. The presence of this pipe has already caused damage to our property on several occasions. The damage was mainly evidenced by substance in the driveway, settlement of the footpath and cracking of brickwork. On the first occasion, when the substance was brought, substance was brought to the attention of council in about 1983, council staff rectified the subsidence. In the second instance in 2007, the council, after CCTV examination, formally acknowledged the presence of the drainage line and essentially re-sleeved only the section of the pipeline traversing our property. On this occasion, we were required to obtain quotes and proceed with the contractor and then arrange for the works to be carried out and seek reimbursement from the council. We are now concerned that further damage to our property due to the presence of a dilapidated pipe may occur at any time. Any future development on the site may be impractical if the experience of the Farrow family is repeated. If there is no reasonable prospect of future development on our property, it would be devalued markedly. The opportunity to leave a legacy to our children would be severely impacted. It appears that there are two options to resolve this matter in a fair and reasonable manner. The council could acquire the affected properties at a value assessed without the pipe or move the pipe to Park Street as suggested previously. The latter option would appear to be the most cost effective. Accordingly, we request the council allocate funding to address the immediate concerns of the Farrow family, which would then alleviate our anxiety. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Mr. Kinney. Um, we now have Mr. Adrian Olhill. Um, he's addressing us in person and um, investigations into environmental, financial and other impacts of synthetic fields. Thank you. Uh, 
good evening, councillors. Good evening, um, councillor staff. My name is Adrian Polhill. I'm a resident in Carl Bay. I'm also the vice president of Oakley Flora and Fauna Conservation Society. I'm here tonight to talk to you about microplastics. You've also heard from Dr. Scott Wilson and Dr. Gary Housley about the seriousness of this issue. Today, I want to just let you know, I never knew how serious the microplastics issue was until I was down at Pulton Park uh, with Dr. Scott Wilson uh, conducting a survey. I thought samples of the rubber crumb. I thought this was a solid rubber underlay on the synthetic turf, but it's not. It's pieces of rubber about one to two millimetres in uh, in size, and it's actually easily moved by water, rain, wind, and uh, and actually all the different uh, sporting activities that occur on the field. It's moved easily into our environment, and that's why I'm here to talk to you tonight. There is not enough mitigation practices and and procedures in place to stop this migration. In that survey, we found that there was more than a million pieces of rubber crumb in a 400 square meter of, um, of the environment, which we surveyed directly adjacent to the Pulton Park playing fields. I'm sure this is happening with our other playing fields here, which are covered with synthetic turf. So we just urge you to consider the motion raised by Councillor Marnie and consider that we do need to investigate the impact of the synthetic pitches as having on the environment. But we, more importantly, we want to identify ways to prevent this rubber crumb moving into the environment. There are many different mitigation procedures and practices. I actually can reference Mr. Martin Shepherd, who is a technical consultant to the AFL, to the NRL, to Rugby Australia, to the FFA and New South Wales football. He has actually got some tremendous solutions in place. I just urge the council to look at those very carefully and, 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 and look at implementing those as soon as possible. Thank you for your time. I will pass those samples around to you. You can see some photos uh, which I've submitted, which graphically show uh, how bad this problem is. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Poldy. Uh, our last speaker is Ms. Catherine Ford. Uh, she'll be addressing us in person, and it's on the Mortal Master Plan. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors, for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. I wish to talk about the Council Officer's response to the question with notice from Councillor Jamison on the Mortdale Master Plan. The timeline set out by Council Officers of October 2023 for the implementation of the Master Plan is completely contrary to what was stated in the recent public meeting with Mortdale Ward Councillors and staff. We were advised that this master plan would be finalised prior to the end of 2022. During the public exhibition of the master plan, Mortdale residents have quite clearly stated that they do not want to see an expansion of the B2 commercial zone in Mortdale, nor do they want to see a, proliferate, a proliferation of um, higher residential densities in Mortdale. The overwhelming response from the public is for a height limit of 12 metres for the existing B2 zone in both Pitt Street and Mortz Road. The resident's own town planner, who presented at recent workshops, also confirmed that the existing commercial zone is sufficient to cater for the surrounding residential dwellings now and into the future, and Council's own commercial centre strategy only indicated a modest increase up to 2036. 
This 12 metre height limit should be implemented as soon as possible to give certainty to the community and prevent any ad hoc planning proposals in the near future. If Council wishes to implement other changes in Mortdale, such as road closures in and around the existing shopping precinct, this could be carried out separately to the master plan. I would now like to comment on affordable housing. Council does not need to impose six and eight storey developments in Mortdale to achieve affordable housing. With generous incentives in the New South Wales State Government Housing SEPP, such as floor space ratio bonuses, we are seeing private development developers already creating affordable housing as part of their development applications. Recent DAs in Railway Parade Carlton, the Strand Penshurst and Railway Parade Mortdale can attest to this and I expect it to continue into the future. Councillors would also be aware that under George's River LEP 2021, there is still the capacity without further rezonings to create an additional 13,000 new dwellings. If only 1% of those dwellings were for affordable housing, Council would be well above its affordable housing targets for the local government area. I implore Council to not overcomplicate this master plan and fast track its implementation so as to give certainty to the public, shop owners and businesses in and around Mortdale. Thank you. People that are actually addressing to the council, and to all those that have addressed the council, thank you for um, participating in this. I'm sure the councillors will take on board the points that you have made. Um, I now go to the confirmation of minutes of the previous meeting. That's the minutes of the ordinary meeting, council meeting, held on the 24th, 23rd of May 2020 to Cohab Mover, moved by Council Lansbury, seconded by Councillor Elmia. Uh, is there any changes to those minutes? Okay, well, I'll put it. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. I declare that motion carried. And councillors, bear with me because I've got a couple of mayoral minutes that I'd like to um, put to you. The first one is the Hurstville War Memorial Commemoration. And um, that happened a few weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. Sorry? Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, the, a century ago, the local community of Hurstville first, uh, Hurstville first commemorated the service and sacrifice of 117 men and boys who were killed in action during the First World War of 1914 to 1916, uh, 1918, sorry. Uh, on the 27th of May 1922, His Excellency Sir Walter Edward Davidson, KCMG, Governor of New South Wales, officially dedicated the Hurstville War Memorial uh, uh, and Council at this time acknowledged that a formal uh, commemorative service be conducted on the 100 year anniversary of this important date. A century later, on the 27th of May 2022, representatives of the local community were once again provided uh, the opportunity to honour those who gave their lives through the service of their country. Her Excellency, the Honourable Margaret Beasley ACQC, Governor of New South Wales, visited the Hurstville War Memorial commemoration where 100 people gathered for proceedings and gave an address at the commemorative event. I attended the event along with Deputy Mayor Councillor Lansbury, Councillor Simonton, Councillor Wang and Councillor Lu. The proceedings were marked with, with a military band, bugler and a guard of honour, followed by a reception at the Marana Auditorium. The RSL is considered the premier ex-service organisation throughout Australia and takes the lead organising role in military commemoration services. The South Hurstville RSL sub-branch is the ex-defence members organisation that covers the Hurstville region. They conduct a community service for Anzac Day 
and Remembrance Day each year at the South Hurstville RSL and the dawn service at Hurstville Memorial, at the Hurstville Memorial. I acknowledge and thank the South Hurstville RSL sub branch, in particular Mr. Terence Payne, President of South Hurstville RSL sub branch, and Mr. Gordon Blair, Honorary Secretary, South Hurstville RSL sub branch, for their tireless work in organising and delivering the special commemorative event. The motion is that Council acknowledges and observes the centenary commemoration of the Hurstville War Memorial and pays respect to those that, uh, that the memorial honours. I have moved it, seconded by Councillor Symington. Uh, I, if anybody else has anything to say, by all means, I'll, uh, I'll take it. Otherwise, I'll put it. Uh, it's just to say, wasn't it fantastic to have the governor, who herself was a former Penshurst resident, as yes, a student? It was, and she spoke very well, we must admit, very well. Now, I'll put that. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I declare the motion carried. Now, we now go on to the Greek Summer Festival. Uh, it was my pleasure to attend the Greek Summer Festival held on Sunday, the 6th of June, 2022. The festival paid tribute to the Greek culture with participation from many revered Greek Australian entertainers, bands and community members. Hosted by St Basil's Homes, New South Wales and ACT and sponsored by George's Rivers Council as part of the community event sponsorship program. Visitors were treated to live performances from the traditional Greek dance groups to world class performers, including one of the biggest names in the Greek entertainment industry, Stelios Dionysio. Over 55, over 55 various stalls were spread across the park, creating a Greek style aura for patrons to enjoy authentic Greek products, food stalls and activities. Many dignities from the Greek Australian community were in attendance, including His Eminence the Archbishop Makarios, Steve Camper, Member for Rockdale, Shadow Minister for Multiculturalism, Shadow Minister for Property, Shadow Minister for Small Business, the Honourable Mark Kure, MP, Minister for Multiculturalism, and the Minister for Seniors, the Honourable Eleni Petinos, MP, Minister for Small Business and Minister for Fair Trading, the Honourable Peter Poulos, MLC, Parliamentary Secretary for War on the Iwara, Mr. Christos Karas, Council General of Greece in Sydney, Her Excellency Mrs. Martha Mavromati, High Commissioner of the Republic of Cyrus, and many more. St. Basil's Homes, New South Wales, as he reported, attendance of over 40,000 visitors to the festival at Carl's Bush Park, cementing the community's desire to gather and celebrate our traditions once more and I have received many compliments from the community and requests for the Greek Summer Festival to be held again next year. I congratulate everyone who has been involved in the planning and success of the event and look forward to celebrating Greek culture next Greek, uh, Greek Summer Festival. The motion is that the Council congratulates St. Basil's Home New South Wales East on the success of the Greek Summer Festival held on the 6th of June 2022. Seconded. Seconded by uh, Councillor Green. The next one is the Merrill Golf Day. And this is the last one, so bear with me. Um, the annual George's River Council Mayor, Mayor's Charity Golf Day held on, the, on Friday the 17th of June proved to be an enormous success with close to $20,000 raised on the day. Um, the charity golf day was commenced by Hurstville City Council and first held in 2002. This year mark, marking the event's 21st uh, edition. With the usual venue, Hurstville Golf Club under extensive renovations, we were able to transfer to Beverly Park Golf Club and they were excellent hosts. A field of 25 teams participated, most representing local businesses who provided generous sponsors. Many of these businesses have been involved since 2002 and I am pleased to report that a number of the players congratulated myself and their council on having this event and supporting a local charity. 
As in previous years, funds raised have been donated to the St. George Southern Medical Research Foundation, SSMRF, and board member and acting CEO, Jill Deering, spoke and thanked all players and particularly council for its support. SSMRF is involved in some of the world leading research and I'm pleased to say funds from this, from the Golf Day will provide 50% of, of a new research grant. My thanks are extended to Phil Bates and the organising committee and to the Lugano, Lugano Alliance, whose volunteers coordinated uh, by Reg Walker worked tirelessly from 6 a.m. until the finish of 2.30 without their efforts and their day. And without their efforts, the day would not happen. Finally, to short, Smith, Frank Bates and the team at the Lee Park Golf Club, thank you for your hospitality and support to of the annual Mayor Charity Golf Day. We now look forward to the Council Charity Pro-Am to be held at Hillsville Golf Course on Friday the 25th of November, supporting SSMRF again. And the motion is that Council thanks all involved in the organisation of the annual Mayor's Charity Golf Day and is proud to donate the proceeds to the St George Slower Medical Research Foundation. I move it. And, uh, Councillor Ansbury seconds. Now, our next. Oh, sorry. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. <laughs> and also for the previous one. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I do apologise. I missed out on those. So. Um, now. We'll now go to uh, uh, a procedural motion in the order of business. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're sorry. At the bottom page, could I? Do we have any condolences, Councillor Marnie? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Only West resident Sharon Cullis or Anderson tragically, tragically passed away on 10th of June. I'd like to work out and expand upon the sentiments expressed by Mark Curie, MP, Member for Oatley, and Minister for Multicultural Affairs and Minister for Seniors in his private member statement dated 22nd of June. Sharon was at the forefront of environmental activism and education, not just within the George River LGA, but across southern and southwest Sydney and the Illawarra and in other areas around Australia. As Principal of George River Environmental Centre and Secretary of the George River Environmental Alliance, Sharon lived and breathed the river and its environs, including bushland areas and tributaries. She helped lead the charge against threats to endangered wildlife, particularly koalas in the Campbelltown and Wallandilly LGAs. Sharon's passion for environmental education extended from community members to company executives and to participants of the juvenile justice programs. Not only was Sharon a board member of the Sydney Metropolitan Water Catchment Authority, but she was also appointed to the National Parks Advisory Advisory Committee and sat on consolidated committees for the South 32 Appen Mine and Moorbank Intermodal. Sharon also helped found and was Vice President of Safe Sydney Koalas. It was thanks to Sharon's tireless advocacy and liaison with former Premier Barry O'Farrell and Mark Curie MP that uh, 6,500 6, hectares of pristine wilderness beside, uh, sorry, between the George River and the Illawarra Escarpment, which would have otherwise fallen into victim to coal mining, have been preserved for current and future generations as the Darrell National Park. In 1992, Sharon gained her master's degree in science and society. In 2004, she graduated as an MA Honours in Science and Technology for her thesis on the damage which would have been caused by building Sydney's second airport, Holsworthy. In 2019, Sharon was awarded a PhD by the University of New South Wales for another thesis titled Fractured Landscapes and Narratives, Controversy in the Southern Coalfield, which critiqued the expansion of mining west of Bulleye and its impact on the George River. Sharon also worked tirelessly within the George River LGA as a volunteer with the Streamwatch and River Health Monitoring Programs and campaigned campaign strongly on many other local issues such as plans for a phone tower and cafe in Oatley Park, high rise on the Oatley Bond Club site, 
uh, and against increased densities within the foreshore section area. Sharon was an active member of Oatley Flora and Fauna Conservation Society and Friends of Oatley, and they recently helped establish Friends of Glenlee. In 2020, the New South Wales Government acknowledged Sharon's many achievements and high level of dedication with the St George Community Award. Sharon was an inaugural community representative with the George River Combined Councils Committee or Riverkeeper, and for that she earned a place on the organisation's honour board, which was the subject of a mural minute in April this year. Sharon was an extremely articulate, courageous and engaging advocate for the environment and was respected by everyone, even those who did not share her altruistic views. A ceremony to celebrate Sharon's life was held at the St George Motorboat Club on the 22nd of June and was attended by over 300 people, including representatives from a whole from a wide range of environment organisations and David Coleman, member of the banks. My thoughts with Sharon's husband, Phil, daughters, Kirsty and Tansy, Mother Morty and Brother Brian, and other family members, and to the scores of her friends and associates who are affected by her passing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lady. Oh, do we have any other condolence motions? No, could we stand, please, for a minute's silence? Thank you, councillors. Uh, uh, Councillor Tech, you've got a procedural motion. I have a procedural motion to move. Just before I do that, I just want to um, thank Councillor Marnie for those lovely words um, tonight. She's a councillor. Just to very briefly, um, when I first came on to council, one of the communities I was on was the GCCC, and um, she was fantastic at, at welcoming me, making me feel like I was part of it, and helping explain the ins and outs of the organisation. A wonderful community. But I'm glad Councillor Marnie was here to share that with us tonight. Um, on the procedural motion, um, it's a motion to rearrange the order of business as it uh, appears up there. So that's the audit and risk, um, the three items that were uh, addressed by members in our, the audience tonight. Then we'll deal with a few other um, economic items followed by the budget or the operation plan. Mr. Mayor. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll put that. All those in favour say aye. Do we have a second? Do we have a seconder? Councillor Green, thank you. I'll put that. Is all those in favour say aye? Aye. All those against say no. Declared it carried. Um, so we'll go to the first one, which is the audit risk. Yeah, the audit uh, risk and improvement committee and internal audit report to council. And we do have the um, chairman here to address this. Thank you. Mr. Clare, Mr. Cliff Hayes, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and councillors. I know we've got a big agenda, so I'll try to be short. Uh, look, um, the Audit Risk and Improvement Committee is required to report annually uh, to council on, on its um, work during the year. The report that is um, submitted to you tonight is an 18-month report um, and that was done so we can align our future reports with the financial year. There are three independent ARIC members and I'm one of those. Um, ARIC is required to, um, under the Local Government Act in its charter, to ind independently advise Council on good governance audit matters, business improvement, risk mitigation controls and financial management. ARIC has fulfilled its requirements, uh, its responsibilities required under the Charter on this reporting period. The key achievements are set out in the report and I, and I won't go through those, but I think it's appropriate for me to just remind Council of a, a couple of things. Firstly, when ARIC considered the financial result um, at the end of 21, it had some concerns because uh, 
principally in terms of your funds, you've got $160 million in cash investments, of which $153 million of that is restricted. So it can only be spent on the specific purpose in which it was established. So really, in terms of what you have as unrestricted funds, it's only $7 million. So council is still at risk in terms of both its long-term and short-term financial sustainability. And that's what we uh, reminded you in that report back on the 30th of September. And given tonight, you're considering the budget and a number of other uh, submissions from, from others about how you might spend your money. Um, those sort of things need to be um, considered. Um, there's a number of cost savings that were um, set out in the approval from my part and given that um, there's a stage introduction of the special rate variation um, those and, and particularly with the current economic conditions um, increased costs and um, impacts on investment from COVID-19 um, the financial risks can be further exacerbated so it's not an easy time at the moment but your financial long-term financial plan does provide the, the planning for the future in terms of how you can retain and maintain that financial sustainability. Look, j just further, of course, we um, the result of the uh, inquiry into the amalgamated Central Coast Council recently showed that clearly um, they did they spent money that they weren't entitled to spend on on things to support their operations, um, and of course they paid the cost for that. So what, what clearly came out of that was that the council is totally responsible for the financial management of, of its organisation. I just think given the pressures that are on you, some of those things need to be, you need to be reminded of. But firstly, I'd just like to say in conclusion that you have a strong financial plan for the future. And um, if, if, if you adhere to that, then you will be financially sustainable. So thank you, and I'm happy to field any questions if anyone wishes to ask me. Uh, councillors, do you have any questions of Mr. Haynes? No. Uh, um, there is no real one. Thank you. Is there, is there any, um, is there any, no motion? Thank you, Mr. Haynes. Thank you. Appreciate your help. Um, yeah, okay. uh, the recommendation here is that the Audit Risk and Improvement Committee and the Antwerp Audit Report of Council 22 be received and noted. Could we have some? Happy to move back, Mr. Mayor. Are you? Sure. Uh, I will move by Councillor Borg, seconded by Councillor Tech. Uh, are there any questions, any discussion on this matter? No? Well, I'll pull it. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those against say no. I declare it carried. Uh, we now go to the uh, deferred report NM04522, Peakers Park Sporting Amenities, and that's in the name of Councillor Konjowski. Moved by Councillor Conjossi, seconded by Councillor Green. Would you like to talk to you? Yes, I will, just uh, very briefly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as uh, Matt, the President of um, Peakhurst United, pointed out, that um, the program for women's football has been growing uh, exponentially over the last few years, and um, in particular for um, Peakhurst United uh, football, where I think um, they only start off with a handful of um, members or players, and now they've got a couple of teams, uh, female teams in the in the in the competition. But further to that, um, St George region has uh, in excess of ten thousand football players, um, and they do need I mean, these blocks. They do need uh, change room facilities. But further to that point is that the female football component of that ten thousand has grown uh, over the, the last few years, and in particular from two thousand and sixteen where uh, for the first time football, female football participation exceeded female netball participation. 
So um, amenities blocks and particularly female change rooms are required in our area. So I'll um, leave you with that. Thank you, Councillor Kujowski. Um, is there any discuss further discussion? Councillor Green. Yeah. yeah, just quickly to second uh, Councillor Kujowski. Obviously agree with everything he's uh, said there. And uh, might I say, Natalie Burke was a very good uh, player about 10 years ago for Pugest United in their, uh, in their girls' competitions. But uh, I want to just highlight the second part of the motion. Uh, which is with regards to the irrigation and drainage plan. Uh, councils would remember in the, the, the recent rains, which recently went for a long time, uh, Peakhurst Park was uh, considerably impacted as all our grounds were, Cars Park, I know, uh, of significant uh, damage down there. Uh, but certainly Peakhurst Park, uh, when I inspected it probably six weeks ago, uh, that the grass was literally up to knee high because uh, uh, the director staff couldn't get on the ground uh, because it was just so wet. Uh, but that has now been, thanks to the director and his team, uh, they've managed to, to get there as the winds have uh, helped to dry the parks out a little. Uh, but particularly important to note the work that's taken place on Peakhurst 1. And it's great to see now that the drainage works, which again, strangely enough, were impacted by uh, the, the significant wet weather. Uh, that drainage work's now taken place and we can investigate irrigation, but particularly drainage uh, on that car, on that uh, Peakhurst Park uh, lower section, uh, where they've now managed to mark out the fields. I think that will be uh, a significant long-term benefit. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Green. Is there anyone, anybody wanting to speak against the motion? I'll take one more for the motion. If it, Did you want your right of reply? No. I'll put it. <laughs> I'll put it. Uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. I declare it carried unanimously. The next one is the uh, notice of motion 052, Hogman Park Lighting Solution. That's in the name of Councillor Bork. Yes, I would like to move that motion. If I could have a seconder, I'd, I'd like to uh, second that. 52. Do we have a second? Second that, Mr. Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Konjowski. Uh, would you like to talk to us? Yes, thank, thank you. you. Um, yes, first of all, I'd like to thank um, the resident Fiona who um, approached um, Cogra Bay um, councillors on this issue and who also spoke tonight in our council forum, uh, in our public forum, to give us an idea of the um, request. Um, so Fiona uh, made the request on behalf of the users of Hogden Park, which as we know is situated in Cogra North at the very edge of our local government area. Um, as we know, Cogra North Precinct is one of the most densely populated areas in the local government area and the development of high rise in this area continues each day in line with the zonings approved in the 2015 New City Plan. With all the development and the increases in population in this area, there's been no increase to the available open space in the area. Um, Holden Park is the only recreational park in close proximity to the Cogra North Development Precinct. Um, there's currently no lighting solution at the park, which features a very popular full-size basketball court. Meaning by 6 p.m. in winter, it is in complete darkness and not safe or useful for the community to enjoy. Um, providing lighting at the park, particularly for the basketball court, to enable an increase in the usage after dark in the winter months is a positive outcome for the community and for the many users of this popular park. Um, this report tonight is for council officers to investigate the best lighting solution um, to enable the increased usage of the park, um, particularly the basketball court, and to undertake the required community consultation on this proposal. Um, and I hope councillors can support the motion. Thank you. Um, Councillor Kajowski asked the seconder, would you like to? Is anyone else wanting to speak to this? No. Um, I'll put it. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. I declare it carried unanimously. And we now go to notice of motion 55, the investigation into environmental, financial and other impacts of the synthetic fuels. Council Marty. I'll second that. Oh, seconded by Councillor Lansbury. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, early this year, early four and four, I off conducted sampling of the soil beside Mavo synthetic fields and discovered that one million particles had migrated from the field. Uh, currently, the New South Wales Chief Scientist and Engineer is conducting a study of the use of the material, including its effects on the environment, 
in other LGOs. I look forward to the staff examining this expert report once it's available and thank them for continuing to do what they can to avert the spread of these particles. Um, but also like the to, to note the efforts of all whose members carried out the painstaking research task and for bringing this matter to my attention. Uh, thanks also to Drs. Wilson and Housley and Mr. Powell for speaking on item tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Lansbury, did you want to speak to that? To Thanks, Thank Mr. Merrick. Well, um, firstly, I'd also like to thank we had the speakers that we had on this earlier tonight, uh, Mr. Polmill, who was with us, and the um, speakers that we had online. I think we, we're at this point where um, synthetic fields have served a purpose, but obviously the technology um, isn't really meeting the environmental standards that we now expect. And I think the fact that there is the New South Wales Chief Scientist doing a report which is due later in the year, hopefully we'll come out with um, some better solutions to um, some of the environmental issues that Mr. Pold Hill addressed, particularly with um, his bag of, of microchips of rubber, which is really concerning. The other side of the coin is that we've had, as everybody remembers, um, some unprecedented rain this season, which has meant that most of the football season, um, the early part of the football season was just a washout. And those clubs that had access to a synthetic field uh, were unfairly advantaged. And there were many other clubs that just were getting their players to register weekly because they weren't getting able, they weren't able to run onto the field. There was nowhere to train. Some of their, their fields were just swampy and, uh, you know, they would just start to dry out and the poor council staff were hoping to mow it, but couldn't it rain again? Synthetic fields, if they're done well, can solve the problem when there is huge demand for our open space. We're increasing our densities constantly and our developers are always asking for that much more, but never are they turning around and providing us with more than token bits of open space. Now, our residents deserve the opportunity to use our open space to as often as they possibly can. Synthetic fields have um, helped that by providing a surface which uh, can be used, even then we do have a lot of rain, but also so does um, good irrigation systems. Now, all of these cost a lot of money, but I think the report that Councillor Mani has called for uh, will find out what industry best practice is. And my understanding is that there is a trial, the director advised me there's a trial at Tempe with cork, which could be more environmentally sound than rubber. I also believe that sand might be an option too, but we have to, find a balance that can address the needs of our sporting community so that they're not sort of sitting on the sidelines or as some coaches have had to do, put their hand in their pocket and, um, you know, they're all voluntary, but they rent space at Tarrant Point or somewhere because their players have not had a chance to run on the field. We have got three synthetic fields in our LGA. However, they're all in the former Hurstville area. We've got nothing in Cogra, so the former Cogra teams are being left behind. So I'm hoping that we can come to some sort of arrangement that whatever is industry best practice that comes out of the, the findings of the chief scientist might mean that this is what we've got to do going forward. I know there's been a lot of um, concern over in Bayside, they've got about eight synthetics. So the worst outcome would be that um, the government directs them should be ripped out because that would be a retrograde step. And I think I'll finish on this. I think you would find that most players would prefer natural turf, but they also want to get game time and they haven't had the opportunity to do that this year. Synthetic fields can fill it, can, can fill that gap. And you know, I'm not an advocate for every blade of grass being turned into synthetic, absolutely not. I was very anti-synthetic fields, but I have seen over the years the demand and the use of the fields, which um, I've walked past Charles Perry yesterday, had quite a bit of money spent on resurfacing it. Um, the rain was great because it sort of, uh, kept it green for a while, but now the field is kind of dead because of the use. You know, they're, they're overused. They don't get a break. They're used seven days a week. That's where synthetics can fill that gap. But on a, from an environmental perspective, uh, they cannot be doing the damage that Mr. Pole Hill um, brought to us tonight because we can't support that. But um, I'd encourage everybody around the table to support Councillor Nani's motion and I thank him for bringing it to us. Thank you, Councillor Andrew. Councillor Mead, for or against? Oh, no, just a correction, Mr. Mayor. Just to, correction? Yes. Uh, yeah. to Councillor Lansbury, and I agree completely with what both speakers have said earlier, but um, it may just a slip of the mind, but we do have just one synthetic in our 
Ward, uh, and Fulton, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, agreed. Agreed, hundred percent. That it's um that there is a use for there, there is a need for more uh, time on synthetic fields. Um, but then there is also the the environmental impacts, which I think we first heard from Catherine Skelsey um, a number of years ago during the last term of council. So, um, yeah, no doubt that there's a lot of studies going on in this in this Thank space. You. Thank you, Councillor. Does anyone does anyone want to talk against the motion? As there's nobody against, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. I declare it carried. Now we're going on to the um, uh, the item CCL 052-22 Local Government Renumeration Tribunal Determination for Mayor and Councillor Fees for the 2022-2023. Councillor Borg, as you're the Chair of Finance and Governance, so I defer to you. Um, Mr Mayor, I'll be speaking against that motion, so I'm happy if you would like to ask for another mover. Okay, so you're against that um, that report. Do we have a motion, Councillors? No motion. Sorry? Can you say something? just says consideration of the Yeah. Well, look, I'll put something up. I'll put something up. I'm happy to move it, Mr. Mayor. I just can't find it. Sorry. Sorry? I've got the council to determine the renovation of mayor to be effective. Yep, I'm happy to move that. Yes, but we need to determine something. We need to determine something. I think I'll I'll um, I'll propose this and council. That's very if you bit uh, if you bear with me. Um, I'm moving the council adopts the two percent increase to the maximum fees as recommended by the local government remuneration tribunal as the remuneration to the councillors and the mayor for the 2022-2023 financial year. I'll speak Seconded by Councillor Lansbury. Um, I'll speak for it. I'll speak for it. Um, I'll speak to it. Councillors, if you look at that report, you'll notice that in the 2018 to 2019 year, there was an increase of about $600 a year. And then in the ensuing three years, there was no increase at all, not one cent. Now, at this stage, the increase that's been proposed is 2%. The overall increase to the budget will be $18,520. I think if you look at the industry and you look at what's happening out in the real world where people are clamouring for increases because the inflation rate is not as uh, diluted what people are taking home, um, I think we are entitled to that minuscule 2% increase. And I say that minuscule because if you if you read the newspapers, read the um, the read the comments made by people that are earning an income and a remuneration is an income. Um, a lot of them are saying the minimum that's, be, that's been given to the community and those people earning an income is 3%. The maximum, I think, is around 5%, 5.2%. So, councillors, I can't see why the councillors in respect of the work that they put into it, and in respect of the fact that there's been a minuscule increase in 2018 of 600, which is about $12.12 per week, I can't see why uh, the councillors uh, who have not received an increase for the last three years can't at least accept the 2% increase, which has been um, which has been recommended by the Renumerations Tribunal, the Local Government Renumerations Tribunal. And as I said before, we're talking about an increase in the overall budget of 18500 and this is for all the councillors and the mayor put together. So in reality, um, I don't see any reason why the community would begrudge that minuscule increase when you consider there was no increase at all, virtually, for the last four years. Councillors, I think in terms of our respectability, and I understand that whether a lot of um, 
uh, people in the higher levels of government believe that the uh, local government and local councils are the lowest run on the ladder. And I, I don't really believe we should be remaining down at the lowest run of the ladder. I actually believe that we deserve a little bit of respect for the jobs that we do and the amount of time we put in to those jobs. So, councillors, I commend my motion to you. I think it's a minuscule amount of money that we're actually increasing uh, in the budget. It's like 0.001% of the budget. Now, really? Thank you. I call for um, either a person, oh, the seconder, sorry. Uh, Councillor Lansbury, would you like to? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll just add to your comments. I, I agree with what you've said. I think uh, a lot of people find, and I do recall the days of COG, I have to just reflect on that. Whenever this came up, everyone was like, oh, I don't want to have a bar of it. I don't want to be the one that moves it. Well, quite frankly, anybody who uh, does this job for a little while realises there's a lot of work involved. It's not just a little part-time thing that you turn up on Monday nights. There's, I estimated once before that I could easily spend about 30 hours a week doing council stuff and uh, I don't think that it's a, a huge problem that we take small percent, two percent increase when you know inflation is currently running at five percent and lettuces are nine dollars a head and all the rest of it. I think realistically we work pretty hard as councillors and I understand that some people will balk tonight and think, no, it's going to send the wrong message to the community. Well, I'm very happy for anybody to call me up and have a chat about it. I think that it's a very reasonable request that we increase it by just a few hundred dollars, bearing in mind that we do pay tax on it anyway. You know, um, it's not like it's just money in our pocket and we're sort of sitting around playing cards on Monday nights. We're here every Monday night. I spent a big chunk of the weekend that went when People who are not on council are probably sitting back watching Netflix or doing fun stuff, going through council papers. And that's what I tend to do most weekends, particularly when we've got a council meeting. I spend a large part of my day um, getting phone calls and getting emails from people in relation to council work. We work pretty hard for this and it is just really an allowance. It doesn't go anywhere near compensating us for the amount of work that we put into it. So, you know, I don't really don't have a problem with supporting a few hundred dollars extra a year when we haven't taken a rise for the last three years. And, you know, I just encourage people to think about it. Um, I know that there will be the, oh no, we can't possibly, we're here for the community and we're just doing that, um, we're just here to serve the community. Well, yeah, we are here to serve the community, but you know, you pay your peanuts, you get monkeys. And if you want to encourage people to do it, you've actually got to make it worth their while. And I think this is a, a really small ask just to increase it ever so slightly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lansbury. I'll take one against or another. Councillor Mayor, you have spoken against. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, and I'd also like to foreshadow a foreshadow a motion that there be a freeze on uh, remuneration of councillors uh, for this year. Um, just have that as a foreshadowed motion, please. Sure, no, that's your board. Just to move here. Oh, no, there's yeah. no secondary in the uh, motions. Yeah. It just comes so up. So we have a freeze, Mr. Mayor, and I take note of the points that both yourself and, and the Deputy Mayor have made. Um, uh, look, councillors, uh, understandably, this is something that generally goes through uh, you know, every other time. However, I think over the course of the last couple of years, uh, we've taken, we've made the choice not to proceed with the increase. Um, because of everything that was going on. And I think it's only fair that we continue with that uh, at this current point in time, because uh, there are still people hurting out there. Um, and for us to uh, sit there and talk about a minuscule amount of uh, increase, well, yeah, these pennies do add up. Um, and as we heard from Mr. Cliff Haynes earlier, um, you know, our unrestricted budget has fallen very quickly. Uh, but further to that point as well, Mr Mayor, and respectfully, I'd just like to remind everyone that standing for council, uh, apart from being a privilege and an honour to serve your community, is also a choice. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Councillor Tegg, are you speaking for? Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't hear. Councillor. Oh. 
Yes, yeah. um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just going to quickly um, speak against the motion, um, and I respect um, what you yourself and Councillor Lansbury have um, spoken about tonight. Um, I do believe that the fee paid to councillors doesn't really reflect the work and the time that's involved in the role, um, and I respect that councillors like yourselves have um, been here for many, many more years than us, um, doing this, doing fantastic work on behalf of the community. Um, but myself and I think my um, other Georgia's River residents and ratepayers councillors, having only been elected um, six months ago, um, I just don't feel like I can justify going out to the community and asking for a 2% pay rise, even if it does only equate to $1,050 a year or $20 a week. Um, and so I'm sorry to my fellow councillors if that decision um, results in the motion going down. Um, however, I feel strongly that when the council has put up rates and removed things like the pensioners rebate, that the community simply will think that the decision to pay ourselves more, well, probably think they probably think it stinks. So that's why I'm speaking against it. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Well, Councillor, it was Council Tech. Sorry, I think I'm about to make the same point, Mr. Konjowski. Yes. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm standing up to speak for the motion, Mr. Mayor. And as uh, Councillor Konjowski has um, just observed, um, uh, 2570 $25,790 is our current um, stipend. 2% um, of that is 515 bucks a year. Um, so we're talking here about $9.90 a week. So we're talking about councillors here being remunerated. At, now, the last time this was increased was on the, the 1st of July 2019. So we've had a fair bit of water under the bridge and as we've all observed, a, a fair increase in everyone's cost of living. Certainly our staff over that period have enjoyed, as they absolutely should, um, increases to their um, award wages. Um, and so what we're talking about here is is not catching up. We are already behind um, significantly on the amount of money that we are being remunerated to do this. As we said, we all do it um, not for the money, um, but at the end of the day, we are asking our community um, for an extra nine dollars and ninety cents a week to do this job, um, we're asking them to consider that we are all people with mortgages to pay and kids to put through school and um, bills of our own, um, and that a significant amount of our time, effort, energy, and resources go into the work that we do here. Um, and that, given that this has been on hold during a significant period of um, upheaval for the council, um, now we are at a time where we will tonight deliver a surplus budget where we are living well within our means, we are delivering um, infrastructure, we are delivering um, those, we're beginning to deliver those things we told our community we would deliver when we spoke to them um, and asked them for their vote last year. And I think uh, an increase in our stipend of nine bucks a week is not an unreasonable um, request on our behalf. Thank you, Councillor Tech. Um, Councillor Symington, I'll take these in any order they come because I think it's a very, very important aspect of uh, being a councillor and being me. Councillor Simon. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, councillor Amir made the comment about choice. Well, actually, by cumulatively doing this, you actually limit the choice of people that can come onto council. Women, for example, and young people, you limit the choice. So unless you're, you're independently wealthy, you're self-employed, you're on a high income, or you make the choice to limit your career path, you can't be on council. So where's the choice there? There's no choice. You're limiting the diversity on council. And I want to just... Hang on, council sorry. and Mayor. Sorry. And I want to just read this article. So why would you be a councillor? Sydney councillors are typically paid between twenty dollars and $35,000 a year. For that money, they're expected to read hundreds, if not thousands of pages of documents every couple of weeks. They're expected to attend formal meetings, workshops with council staff and events with local community. This system is fine if we only want to attract onto councils semi-retired professionals working out of noblesse of legal. It, it is a fine if we want to attract people onto council who see the real benefit in a profile I might give them for future political careers. It's fine if we want to attract to council people who might see some world benefit for themselves or their mates for being there. The system works well if the aim is to encourage a broad representation of society onto the governance boards of these increasingly, thanks to council mergers, significant and influential organisations. There are, of course, large numbers of councils, the majority in the most places, who do the job for the right reasons, and I'm one of them. I value what I do, and I value the effort that I put in. There should be a greater majority. So yes, councillors should be paid more, and if some of those are undeserving. 
and I believe we should get that increase. And that was an article by Jacob Saw from the Sydney Morning Herald. And I make I I, 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 I I'm not going to apologise for wanting that minuscule amount because I work hard in my job, and if it means that we have a bigger diversity on council, that's a great thing. Thank you, Councillor Symington. Do we have any other people? Yeah, Councillor Wang, I'll just take them as they come. Sure. So I will speak uh, for this motion. Uh, talking about the choice, I think we can all cho choose to donate our uh, income to charity. Um, I I have a day job in the corporate world, work hard and paid as a professional. Uh, when I became a counselor, I worked just as hard, even though I don't work at the, you know, we should pay as an industry professional. But I do want to bring professional, more professionals into the counselor's job, do our job. That's what I would like to promote. And uh, as part of that, a fair remuneration, it should be part of the conversation. It's up to debate what the fairness is about. Well, the general feedback I got from the community, from my residents is, so you guys are paid the peanuts, which we are. And uh, in a sense, they, they're not taken seriously. It's affecting our uh, exception as a professional, you know, uh, who's holding some of the statutory uh, responsibilities. So for, from that aspect, so I support this motion just because I want to stir up the debate, not only in this chamber, but in the community. I wanted the community to point the finger and say, you got a 2% increase. What work have you done? Have you done your paper? Have you attended meetings? Where, I, where have you been? That's what I want to, the community to hold us responsible. I want everybody in this chamber to be holding yourself responsible. That's why I'm supporting this motion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wang. Councillor Strati Couples. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, fellow councillors. Look, um, I'm speaking against this motion uh, purely on the grounds that, like my fellow councillors, some have said, uh, I consider it an honour to be here today. Um, and for me personally, it's been a little bit of a lifelong dream. Um, I was under no illusion that when I decided to run for council that um, as handy as any further funds are to any pay packet, um, I wasn't here to do it for the money. And don't get me wrong, I think it's possible that by increasing the pay packet of a councillor by $9 a week, that we may potentially attract Australia's best to decide to become councillors because I think that, you know, $9 is a, is a lot of money, a lot of money. And I have no doubt that future corporate executives will put their future aside and say, hey, I'm going to become a councillor. What up, Mr. Mayor? Yes, your point of order, Councillor Simonton. Clarification. It was about a cumulative because for the last, this will be three years now, we haven't taken a pay rise. Cumulative. Cumulative. Thank you. Councillors, does anybody else want to address this issue? Well, it's not a big deal. Why are we having such a massive yeah, discussion? Councillor Stratikopoulos, please. Democracy. Now, does anybody Apologies, else Mr. Mayor. Sorry. Councillors, I'll take my right of reply. I'm interested in some of the comments that have been said, more so than ever now than in the past. Um, I do remember a time, and that goes back probably about 27 years, when someone got up and said, oh, we do it because we've got where it's, it's part of the honour of representing committee. Yeah, I agree. It is part of the honour of representing the committee. It is part of what we are elected to do. But at the same time, why are we demeaning the role of a councillor, demeaning the role of the mayor to be the lowest paid level of government? I mean, Councillor Lansbury said she spends roughly about 30 hours. 
give or take a couple of hours. I don't know. The mayor, and I think Councillor Green would agree with me, it's a full-time job and it includes Saturdays and Sundays. And you say, well, the mayor gets paid more than us. I understand that. But when you look at, in comparison to what the other levels of government get, it's minuscule in, in terms of what we get. Now, having said that, we're not money hungry. We just want some respect, some respect for the job that we do and the time we put into it. And sometimes that respect comes in the form of remuneration. If you're working for 20 cents an hour, do you really think that the community respects you or you respect yourself at that sort of figure? It's, it's almost like, <laughs> I won't say it because it, it's, it will be reported in the leader as the mayor being a bit of a recalcitrant. Now, let me put it to you this way. We have been striving for recognition, constitutional recognition of local government. We have been striving to be recognised in our community as something, as an important, as um, some representation which is a very important level of government. It is a very important level of government because we have direct contact with the people. They can ring us at any time. They can talk to us. We can then present our cases to the, to the council officers. And at the end of the day, we do a lot more work in terms of impacting on our community than those state government and federal government people do because they have very little contact with their community. Anyway, having said all that, I want the respect, instead of people turning around to me and saying, why do you do it? You're crazy. And I have to turn around and say, because I enjoy it, I'm not going to be the leader of the Republic. I'm not going to be the president of Australia. I do it because I love the community and I want to work for the community. But at the same time, give me a little bit of respect and give you a little bit of respect. So this business about uh, it's pittance and it doesn't matter. No, it does matter. It's symbolic of our roles. So please support my motion because I think it's really important that we send that message that we are responsible people, we are people, an important level of government, and we need to actually be remunerated, not for what we work, but to get us out of that mere pittance. Thank you, councillors. Now, as there's no more discussion on this, I will put the motion, and I think we'll have to go around the circle. Of course, I'm for it. Councillor Kujewski. Uh, I'm against, against Mr. Mayor, we're going that way. It's okay, I'll, uh, Councillor Borg. I'm um, against the motion. Councillor Elmere. Against. Councillor Green. For. Councillor Jamison. Against. Councillor Kanjarski. Against. <laughs> Councillor Lansbury. For. Councillor Liu. Against. Councillor Marnie. Against. Councillor Mort. Against. Councillor Smirnley. Against. Councillor Stratocopoulos. Completely against. Councillor Simonson. 100% for diversity. Councillor Teg. I'm for the motion. Councillor Wang. For the motion. That's nine against. Six, four. How many, four? Six. I declare the motion lost. Thank you, Council. Mr. Mayor, we had a foreshadowed motion from Councillor Elmir. Yes. I move the foreshadowed motion from Mr. Mayor, um, provided that the wording is is correct um, to the general manager, that there be a freeze uh, for, for this year until things sort of start improving again. For this financial year? For this financial year, correct, Mr. Mayor. No change in the remuneration. I'm getting some advice from the count. From the there's no change in the new remuneration for this financial year. 22-23. Can, can I just ask a question on that? What? How is that different from the? Is that just preventing someone bringing back a motion? How is it different to what we just? Sorry. Voted on. 
Sorry. So we, we didn't vote to adopt a fee. We just voted not to increase it by 2%. Thank you, Councillor Tick. Um, okay, well, I don't, if you want to discuss it, I'm quite happy to discuss it. Uh, is there any discussion on this? Um, I will, might as well go around the horseshoe again and just put it. Yeah, I'll put it, but we'll go around the horseshoe. I want it, rigid. I want it recorded. Yeah, I means for, against. Councillor Borg. Who's Councillor Lee? If we're voting on the I'm fee remaining the same, I'm um, for the motion. Councillor Elmer. For. Councillor Green. For. We need a motion. <laughs> Councillor Jamison. Against. Councillor Kanjarski. Uh, for. Councillor Lansbury. Um, I think I have to be with Councillor Green on this. We need a motion, so I guess four. Councillor Liu? Four. Thank you. Councillor Marnie? Four. Councillor Mort? Against. Councillor Smirdley? Four. Councillor Stratocopolis? Four. Councillor Symington? Four. Right. Councillor Tech? For the motion. Councillor Wang. Against. That's 11 for, for against. You clear the motion. Um, <coughs> uh, Thank you, councillors. Uh, we're now going to the CCL 057-22 deferred report. Um, regarding council of superannuation contribution. Councillor Paul. I'm um, happy to move that motion. You're moving it? Yes. Seconded by Councillor Symington. Thank you, Councillor Symington. Um, I'm I'll, happy to resume um, my right. Uh, did you want to talk to no, her? I'm happy to reserve my right. Yeah, Councillor Symington, did you want to talk to her? I'm happy to reserve my right to Councillor Tech, did you, uh, does anybody want to talk to him? Well, I'll put it. Um, I think we'll go around the circle again. Well, is anyone going to speak against it? No. All right. Well, I'll put it. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. I declare the motion carried. Aye. I declare the motion carried unanimously. <laughs> to be reported as against, sir. Yeah, okay, that's fine. So I'll put it again. All those in favour say aye. All those against, put their hands up. Three against, four against. Five against, where are they? Five against. Thank you. Um, now we're going to work in the CCL zero. 54-22, working together uh, for a better future and the delivery program operation. Councillor Paul, that's your area. Yes, Thank I you. would like to move the motion with an amendment, which um, the staff have been provided with. Do you want me to talk through the amendment uh, or just yeah, leave it up? Actually, who, we've got a seconder first up. Councillor, uh, seconded by Councillor Lansbury. Thank you. You could talk to him. Um, I do want to uh, speak to her, but if you want to um, just pop it up on, on the screen and everyone can have a look at it whilst I um, speak. So, yeah, firstly, um, I'd just like to thank the community for their engagement um, on the operational and delivery plan. Um, sometimes known simply as the budget. 
Um, Council received an astonishing 70 submissions during this year's exhibition period, up from just six submissions last year. And there were 284 individual items raised during the exhibition period. Um, so I'd like to thank the staff who have reviewed all of the community feedback um, and provided responses to all the 70 submissions, which is an attachment to tonight's business paper and has informed councillors in our decision making. Um, this level of engagement to an operational and delivery plan budget shows us the community is engaged and wants to have a say on the future direction of council. Um, and I'm pleased to say that council has listened to the community. Um, we received many submissions about the lack of action for the planning and building of a third aquatic facility in the LGA. And I'm pleased to say that the operational plan now includes a strategy to progress construction of a new aquatic facility in the LGA with specific actions that Council will deliver by June 2023, including one, to select a suitable site for construction of a new aquatic facility in the LGA, to seek funding to progress construction of a new aquatic facility in the LGA, and three, to undertake a feasibility study for construction of a new aquatic facility in the LGA. Uh, in addition, there were many submissions where the community voiced their concerns on the future of the council's branch libraries at Oatley, Penshurst and South Hurstville. I'm um, worried that the that council would close these important community facilities down. Um, instead of the action item in the operational plan being to assess these libraries for their suitability and community use, council will now assess the best use cases for programs and community usage at these libraries so they can best cater to the needs of the community into the future. Looking to the environment, developing a significant tree register has been on the council's wish list for a few years now, but it hasn't quite made its way into being an action or a funded item. Um, we've prioritised the significant tree register in this amendment here, so this year it will be funded and it is um, specifically outlined as an action item that Council will deliver by June 2023. Uh, I just wanted to briefly talk on the, the that's more to do with the operational plan, um, which is a, around a lot of the actions that Council intends to do, um, and those actions really show the intent of Council, so it is important that these are updated and reflect um, the submissions provided by the community. Um, now, if we, move, if we move to the dollars and cents part of the budget, um, I'd like to thank Council CFO, um, Chief Financial Officer, Ms Parker and her team who've done a, the hard work bringing together this budget and trying to balance all of Council's legislative, legislative requirements and priorities whilst still adhering to Council's long-term financial plan. Council will be delivering a budget operating surplus this year, the first time since the Council was elected in 2017. Um, there have been some tough decisions made to achieve this result, um, with many items missing out on funding this year, um, and Council officers will vigorously pursue state and federal grants to deliver as many of these projects as possible. Um, and I'm pleased to be putting forward this amendment um, tonight um, for the 2023 operational and delivery, delivery plan to be adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lansbury, did you want to talk to it? Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Mayor. We'll just add a couple of points and just ask if we could please scroll down. So where it finishes now, it says the following items be reduced or deferred. There are another list of items that should be included in the budget. Down a little bit, please. Yeah, I've got a bit too far. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, so, so we can see that this would have been included basically. So we've got, uh, yeah, so we've got the increase to Council's contribution to the Georges River Council Combined Committee, um, the, well, the Council superannuation, which we've just voted on, not unanimously, but we have actually voted on that. And I just wanted to highlight the fact that Council um, has every, every year we've had a budget here, there has been a proposal to reduce the, or remove, sorry, sorry the Council grant days, which are, for those who don't know, are, uh, provided to staff over the Christmas break period, which often is to do with like the shutdown period. And it has been an entitlement that council staff have had for quite some time. And I think that it's really important for staff morale, for one thing, um, that we include it. And it's about 600,000, maybe 650, I think, to retain that in the budget. I have always, as has many other councillors every year, I think it's been pulled out. We've put it back in. Councillor Tegg, you have, every year um, brought that back to us to include that in the budget. Uh, the significant tree register is important. That's been hanging around quite some time and there has part of that's going to be funded by the Resilience Fund. 
the Council to Discretionary Award Fund, um, there wasn't money in that, but I think uh, previously, but we are going to include that, just a small component, which would work out about $3,000 per councillor. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. And um, the thing that I actually brought to council within the Environment and Planning Committee to have a population data analysis and forecast report, which is going to inform how our planning staff uh, we'll be able to come up with things uh, going forward. We've got a couple of big projects still in the works with the Mortdale Master Plan and we're constantly um, being asked to increase our densities and we're getting proposals. Do we need more childcare? Do we need more of this? Do we need more of that? We all know we need open space, but we actually need the data that is specific to our area, not just from the census or, or other things like that. Um, playing field lighting upgrades, things like that are very important to the community. That amount we've, we've earmarked here is not going to go that far, but it's going to help someone. And with finalising the Mortel Master Plan um, for an amount of $60,000 and to contribute $100,000 towards the Master Plan traffic studies, which are imperative, we need to talking about increasing densities, uplift, however we want to phrase it, we need to have an accompanying traffic study because naturally increasing densities and uplift does create additional traffic and we need to know where that tipping point is. Someone like me would say we've already reached it, but you know, let's leave it to the experts. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers tonight, um, James Farrow and Dennis Kaneem. Thank you for sharing your story about your problem with your stormwater. I am really sorry that I don't think we can address it in tonight's budget. However, you have my word that I will follow it up and do what I can and get an update for you. My understanding was that it was being investigated by council staff. I would need to defer to the director and it's probably better that we do that out of the council meeting as to uh, whether there is something that council can do to assist you. Um, thank you for, for sharing that with us tonight. Um, I can't really take the opportunity to speak about the seeding season private certifiers, but until someone stops me, I will say my view has always been that they are the tools of the devil and that is something that we need to lobby the state government hard and fast about. That is a separate issue. Councillors, um, Councillor Borg has done a lot of work on this as chair of the uh, Finance Committee and I would ask you to consider these amendments. There is quite a bit there. That's why it's going over the two screens. I hope everybody is having an opportunity. That's why I went through the things that were being included because they weren't um, visible originally. I would ask for your support on this. Um, we are always being asked to do more with less, but I think we still are going to be in surplus from when uh, a couple of years ago when we were looking at $13 million deficits and the sky was going to fall and everything was a disaster. Council officers, to their great credit, have been able to turn things around. Um, we can land with it with um, in surplus, even if we do have these few extra things that we've been able to slide in there. Obviously, we need to be very careful and we can um, always defer to the expertise of our council officers, the directors and their staff. But I think a lot of work has gone in to bring it to where we've landed tonight and I'm seeking your support on behalf of the Chair of the Finance Committee to support what we have come up with on the screen tonight. Thank you, Councillor Ainsbury. I will take one against unless Councillor Tegnor... Yeah. Are you speaking against Councillor Yes. Yeah, up okay. your head. Okay. Uh, Mr Mayor, um, I will speak against this, but I'd, I'd like to move an amendment to the motion up before us. Um, and move the original motion that was put forward by council staff. Mm. Put that as a motion, uh, as an amendment, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Mayor, the reason being is that- well, you're putting it as an amendment, do you have a seconder? Or does the, uh, the um, mover accept that? Um, do you have a seconder? Oh, well, where is it? It's for you. Councillor Konjowski appears to be the seconder. Right. Now we're actually speaking to the amendment. Okay, Mr Mayor, so I will speak for the amendment, uh, given that it was seconded. Uh, Mr Mayor, I think the council officers have done a, a great job in putting this together and I uh, take on board the great deal of work that's been used to get, to, get council to a position of $1.9 million surplus now. Uh, given that the motion that was carried just earlier regarding the superannuation, I understand that that surplus will drop 
to $1.85 million um, and a $20,000 increase to, um, sorry, Marina, I'm trying to read off the screen, um, uh, that $20,000 increase. So it comes down to $1.83 million. Councillors, the reason why I think we need to move with the recommendation that was put together by council officers, um, knowing that they have been working on this for not just this year, but for a number of years now, um, because of our short and long-term financial outlook. Uh, councillors, when we made the tough decision last year to increase rates, we made a commitment to the community that we will find savings in our future budgets. And those savings were in the vicinity of $2 million every year for the next five years. Councillors, the longer that we put off making those savings, the longer it will take for us to achieve our long-term financial sustainability. And by doing so, I don't think that it's fair on us to continue kicking the can down the road because no one likes to make tough decisions, uh, especially when you're taking things away from people or services uh, that you may think at, at, at high priority. Now, council officers do this for a living. They, they do this day in, day out. They understand what comes back to us as councillors. We portray that back to the council officers and they put it together and they tell you, councillors, this is what we believe is the right thing to do, given all the feedback that you've given us on how to apply uh, the savings that are needed moving into the future. Councillors, we have to work hard to try and achieve those $2 million savings every year for the next five years because as custodians of the community's money and ratepayers' money, I think it's important that we uh, show that we can get council back into an operational surplus within the next five years. Otherwise, we're not delivering on the commitment that we made last year and that we continue to make to our residents and ratepayers moving into the future. Councillors, I think what the council officers have put forward to us is very wise and has been thought through diligently. In the past, we have reintroduced certain things like the grant days for staff. Um, but I also acknowledge that in the past, we have had significant lobbying from the union and, and other members of staff uh, to continue those grant days, not being for them in the past. Uh, but you know, this year, I'm sure the general manager and his team have been able to negotiate these things with staff and that's probably why we haven't heard from them. So, Mr Mayor, I think it's important that we adopt the, the, the budget as was recommended by council staff. Thank you. Councillor T. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Look, um, I'll just keep my comments. I, I want to speak on the original motion, hopefully when we get back to it. Um, so I'll, I'll just focus on the one big difference between the motion or the amendment moved by Councillor Almir and the original um, motion moved by Councillor Borg. And, and in my view, that's grant days. That's three days a year that our staff are given um, through custom and practice um, from both former councils um, as a way of us of, of us looking after our staff, right? That this is a way that we thank and reward them for their hard work every other day of the year. Um, and I think it is, um, in, it's very important for us that we let those staff know in what has been a tumultuous year. And for those of you watching the live cast, continues to be um, an emotional um, and, and stress-filled year for the people who work here at George's River Council. Um, and so I think it is incumbent on us to deliver those grant days. Now that means we need to move some money around in order to achieve that. We don't just want to take $600,000 off the bottom line without making sure that we're doing our best to save all the money we can while investing the money in both the human um, and, and physical capital and resources that make this council work. Um, while Councillor Elmi might not have um, got a phone call um, from the union that represents the workers here at George River Council, I can assure him and everyone else here that I have. Um, I know uh, Joel has been in touch with me, I assume he's been in touch with some others of you, um, to impress upon us um, that it is still the view of his members that work in this place, um, that those grant days are an important part of making this a great place to work, and we want to keep it a great place to work, which is another amendment that I plan to move to the original motion, but for the purpose of, of speaking to this amendment, um, I oppose it um, for a few reasons, um, primarily because it takes grant days away from our fantastic staff here at Council. So, Thank, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Teague, is uh, our Council agreed? 
Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr Mayor. I also uh, stand to oppose the amendment, basically on the same grounds as uh, Councillor Teg in terms of the grant days and their necessity for uh, the staff. I think our staff do a wonderful job in, uh, in very difficult circumstances, and that applies to both the indoor and outdoor staff. So I'm more than happy to support the 600,000. Might I say, in forming a budget, I actually don't agree with every component of the budget. I'm sure if I asked everybody around the table whether they agreed with every component part of the budget, uh, they'd probably disagree. Uh, but negotiation is what gets a budget through, and it doesn't matter whether it's the council, uh, whether it's the federal government, or it, whether it's with your wife and or partner uh, trying to determine what you're going to spend your money on. Uh, there will always be negotiation. and. Uh, I accept the fact uh, that uh, the amendment um, allows for certain things and it doesn't allow for other things, but I accept that. I think it's also worth putting on the record here, councillors, uh, that the rate rise to which has been referred, uh, in fact, in this first year, only covered for the removal of the special rate variation uh, that was put in and lasted 15 years by Thurstable City Council. So that was only accommodating uh, what was actually taken away. So the percentage that was increased on Thurstable Council rates actually came off and then there was a, a, a percentage put back on and that uh, provided, as I say, the, uh, the figure for this year. So what has in fact happened is there has been a significant reduction in capital projects that are, we are able to provide as a council, but that enables us as a council to produce and provide a surplus in whatever quantum we decide. Originally 1.9 million, I think in this, uh, 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 sorry, the original motion moved by Councillor Borg, $1.2 million. So that's where we've gone. As I say, we've negotiated to that point. Uh, I'm happy to accept that negotiated position particularly in regards to the uh, grant days for our staff. And that's why I will uh, vote against uh, Councillor Elmir's uh, amendment. And I'm happy to support at this stage the uh, proposal put up by Councillor Ball. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Symington. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have always supported the grant days and I will not um, support taking them away. But there seems to be a little bit of incongruency here. Um, just with the councillor's um, remuneration about not increasing it by 2%, so feeling empathy with the community, but then you're happy to take the grant days away from the workers. Like, sorry, but it doesn't seem consistent to me. Like, you don't care about them, but you care about that that 2%. And also, just to enlighten you, the USU did start a petition. They called George River Council the Grinch. So, yet yeah, they really did care about losing grant days. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Simonton. Has anybody got anything else to say? Oh, yes, Mr. Matt. Uh, I'll be brief with my uh, comments. Um, yes, we do. We do very much need to be careful how we spend our money, uh, particularly over the course of the last couple of years where our uh, income has been tight and uh, our budget has gone into um, into the red. So we need to make sure that, um, for now at least, we do freeze some of these expenses that we can and look forward to uh, bringing things back down the track when we do have a lot more. Uh, a lot more reserves and can afford these sorts of things. So we need to be very careful with how we spend our money. And um, unfortunately, sometimes, um, as Councillor uh, Symington puts it, you've got to be the, the Grinch. Um, so, um, <laughs> um, so we do need to be very careful and we do need to be um, wary of where the money is being spent. And I believe that, um, that um, the, the staff have uh, put together a, a, a good budget, and I think we should stick to that. Thank you, Councillor Konjowski. Does anybody else have something to say? Now, Councillor Lee, would you like your right of reply? No. Well, I'll put it. Um, I'll say all those in favour say aye. Aye. All those against say no. No. Yeah. Division is on the table. Yeah. Um, I'm, Mr. Mayor. I'm against. Councillor Ball? Against the amendment. Councillor Elmere? For. Councillor Green? Against the amendment. Councillor Jamison? Against. Councillor Kinjarski? For. Councillor Lansbury? Against. Councillor Lou? For. 
Thank you. Councillor Mani. Against. Councillor Mort. Against. Councillor Smirley. For. Councillor Stratacopoulos. For. Councillor Sinington. Against. Councillor Teck. Against the amendment. Councillor Wang. Against the amendment. So what do we have? Ten against and five for. Declare the amendment lost and we'll go back to the original uh, uh, motion. Um, did anyone, did you, Councillor, did you want to talk to that original? Yes, I was hoping to speak to the amendment, moved by Councillor Bull. I'm, I'm going to suggest um, a further amendment um, that I hope you, oh, actually, before I do that, I'm going to ask a question through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, which councillor salaries were put into the budget to remind me? Were they at the current level or were they increased by the rate peg? I'll go to the direct by the um, determination. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to pass that on to our CFO, Ms. Parker. Oh, use the general manager. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So the budget on uh, presented to you tonight includes the assumption that there would be an increase of two percent, which equates to about ten thousand dollars. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to suggest two amendments. Um, the first is um, to cancel the board's motion in the savings section to put in um, freeze councillor salaries at a saving of ten thousand um, dollars, and in the um, spending section where she had uh, in the savings section as well where she has, uh, and the second last dot point there, um, reduced uh, $100,000 out of the professional development training budget um, by $100,000. I'd seek to strike that out. Now, before I ask Councillor Borg's view on those two things, I'd just like to speak to them both. First, it's pretty obvious, we have just done that, so we should reflect that in our motion. I'm um, happy to let you speak to them, just to provide clarification. At this no, point. So this is just me speaking to yeah. the motion, and Why at the end of it, I will ask Councillor Borg if she accepts those amendments. Okay. Um, but I just wanted to foreshadow with everyone what those were. Uh, in relation to the, the second change that I'm seeking there in relation to the professional development and training fund um, that we put aside there. Now, my view, Councillor, is that we're going to always be doing more with less. Um, and I think that, again, the way that we achieve more with less is by investing in capital. That's either physical capital, that's, you know, trucks on the road and bitumen in the, in the back of them um, to, to fill holes, or it's human capital. We're investing in our people so that they can get more stuff done in the time they're here, they can get higher quality work done in the time we're here, and we're only going to achieve that, councillors, if we invest in them. We want this to be a place that people want to come and work, that improves their careers, that improves them as employees, um, and it helps them deliver the things that we require of them when they're working here at George's River. And I think by removing $100,000 out of that training budget, we're still going to be asking our staff to do more with less, because that's what this whole budget's about, that's what the savings about. We, we know from the advice from staff that we're finding it harder and harder to fill jobs. Um, we've already got a hold in place, but even once that hold is complete, we're finding it harder and harder to find fill people. Not because it's not a great place to work, but because there's only 3% of people without a job in Australia at the moment, and not all of them live in Sydney and want to work in local government. So we need to be continue to be at the sort of place people want to work, that when we do get people here, we invest in them and keep them here, and that when we do ask them to keep getting better year on year, we're giving them the tools and the and the investment in them that we need to do that. So that's why I'm moving those two changes. Other than that, I'm I think we've found a good balance here. Um, uh, and sorry, we'll need to obviously update the total surplus figure um, to accommodate for the ninety thousand dollar change. Um, but those are the, those are the, the the amendments I'm suggesting. I think the rest of it's a good balance in bringing making sure that we can deliver the grant days, um, while also you know making sure that we're able to deliver. Um, a sustainable budget, which I think we're able to do. So I suggest those to the mover. Thank you, Councillor Tech. Councillor Bull, do you accept those? Yeah, um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, yes, I will um, acknowledge in the reduction in, uh, sorry, adding the $100,000 back into the <laughs> staff training, obviously just acknowledging that that will affect the surplus, as our Councillor Tech said, um, and I'm, I'm happy to accept the um, amendment on that basis and, and thank Councillor Tech for his collaboration on the amendment. Thank you. So the um, your amendments have been accepted. They become the motion. Um, is there any further discussion on this? There's nothing there. 
Yeah, yeah, but you've got to, that'll have to be amended. Yeah, okay. um, before we actually go further, I think we need the manager of finance uh, to actually indicate what the figures are now. I actually think that the difference is 18,520. I actually think the difference is not ten thousand dollars. The reduction is eighteen thousand five hundred and twenty. Uh, can the manager uh, clarify the issue? Yeah, just um, through you, Mr. Mayor. I think once we receive all the figures, we'll the, there is a recommendation in there. Um, for once all the resolutions have come through, we'll amend the bottom line. But I believe just quickly it's 1237 is the new um, surplus. Right. But I would like to check it. <laughs> well, subject to being confirmed by the uh, Director of Finance and Governance. So maybe we can put that figure up there and could we just add to subject to it being confirmed? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we, what do we got there? Uh, to be confirmed by the. Uh, okay. All right, councillors, I don't think we need to discuss it any further unless somebody else wants to. Okay, I will put it, but I think we're going to have to go through the circle. Mr. Mayor, your vote? I'm for it. I don't know if there's anyone against it. <laughs> Just take the vote. <laughs> All right, I'll try that. Is anyone against it? Okay, I declare it. <laughs> That'll do. All those against say, all those for say, yeah, I. All those against say, no. I declare it carried unanimously. Okay, so let, let's go to the next item. Which I believe is the sorry, Mr. Mr. Mayor, yes. just to confirm uh, that before Mr. Convene and Mr. Farrow leave, just to confirm what Councillor Lansbury said and just to formalise that so as everyone's aware, uh, there will be a question with notice on the next council agenda. So that makes it a formal reply uh, to the questions raised. Uh, in the, uh, the the open forum, okay. So I just think we need to formalise that. I'll put that, or Council Lands, we can put that somewhere. Yeah, put it. So just so as the residents are aware, there will be a formal response provided. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Green. Um, we now go to, I believe, the um, the report of the Environment and Planning Committee, Councillor Lansbury. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'll move the report. Seconder. I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Marnie. Uh, I'll put it. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I declare it carried unanimously. We now go to the report of the Finance and Governance. Um, I'm happy to move that um, committee paper in full, Mr. Mayor, please. Okay. All right. So that's been moved by Councillor Ball and seconded by. Council agreed. Um, that's okay. All right. Well, I'll put that. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I declare that carried. Um, now we go to the report of Assets and Infrastructure Committee meeting held on the 14th of June. Councillor Symington, yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, but I just want to firstly confirm with Councillor Borg that she's pulling out AS0016 22. Okay. Um, uh, Which one? Identification of council land for bicycle and netball facilities in George's River. So you, Council Borg's pulling that out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'll move um, ASS zero one five dash two two in the report, and ASS zero one seven dash two two in the report. Uh, seconded by Council Konjowski. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. Councillor Bolt, you're pulling, I declare it carried. 
um, Councillor Bull, you're, you're uh, pulling out A double S zero sixteen dash twenty two. Did you have an amendment? Yes, I would like to uh, move an amendment to that motion, um, which I've provided to the staff. Um, and I'm happy to just um, talk through what the amendment is, and then yeah. you can um, call for a seconder. What's the amendment first up? So the amendment is that council receive a note, council land, yeah. and the amendment is um, to add in, with the exclusion of the site at Net Strata Jubilee Oval Redevelopment Cogra, um, identified in this report that can be used to build a basketball netball centre to accommodate the needs of both St George Basketball Association and Netball, St George Netball Association. Do we have a seconder? Okay. Councillor Lansbury, seconded by Councillor Lansbury. Did you want to talk to that? Um, yes, very briefly, if I could, please. Um, Firstly, I support Council's actions to identify locations for the provision of a new um, netball and basketball courts to support the population growth in the area. Um, I support Council investing um, funds equitably across sporting codes. Um, and some may say that netball and basketball have, may have missed out on investment in recent years when there's been significant funding directed into other sports. Um, however, my amendment here tonight, which is to exclude Net Strata Jubilee um, from the locations identified, is made on the basis that to date, uh, councillors and the community have not cited or had any opportunity to comment on the draft master plan for Net Strata Jubilee. Uh, and without seeing that plan, uh, the only place I could envisage three indoor hard courts at that location would be on the site of the adjacent Cogra Park. And as important it is for council to cater to the future sporting needs of the population with sporting infrastructure, it should not be at the expense of precious passive open space, um, which is also vital to the current and future needs of the community, especially in an area as densely populated as Carlton, which has already been rezoned for much further increased densities. And I hope councillors can support this amendment. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to work out how we're voting on what is actually in a report. So, no matter with no matter which way we vote on this motion, it's still in the report. We didn't write the report; we received the report. So the content is in the report, and much as we've all liked to change history over time, we can't actually change what's in the report. We can, to be fair to Councillor Borg, if something comes up in the future about building at Net Strata Jubilee or Tallawalla Street or the other options that were provided, including at uh, uh, the Johnny Warren Centre, we can, as a council, determine whether that structure goes there, but we can't change what is actually written in a report. So, I'm sorry, Mayor, I... I think the issue that we've got is probably best and just hear me out on this <clears throat> and then I'll call on the director because we did have a meeting with Councillor Ramir, myself and uh, the people that are um, uh, involved directly with basketball this afternoon and Chris, uh, Ms. Christy uh, uh, Dodd. Um, now, I think it might be wiser if we indicate that the council um, uh, accept the recommendation in connection with Tallawalla and the Pensehurst, um, the Pensehurst um, uh, project for the purposes of, worse than that, for the purposes of providing basketball courts and netball courts, but exclude net strata. Is that? Can you? Uh, can sorry, I, sorry, Mr. Mayor. Direct? Sorry, again, I'm happy to listen to the director, but you, you've actually, I think, again, missed the point. All we're doing is receiving and noting a report that has been written. We're not adding to the report. We're not subtracting the, from the report. All we're doing is receiving a note. As I say, and whether it's Tala Waller or whether it's Johnny Warren or whether it's Net Strata Jubilee or anything else, I can't think of anything else that's included in that report. We can't change what was written in the report. And that's why I think this motion is indeed um, redundant. Well, I think what the essence of the motion is, and I, uh, I'm going to refer that to the director, the essence of the motion is to allow what's in the report, but to exclude that strategy really open. Uh, 
missed that's about as simple as that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just so can I get yes, the sorry. director to answer this, please? So, Mr. Mayor, what is written in the report is a technical assessment of feasibility of um, certain sites. There's no, um, I guess, commitment provided that any of those sites that anything would be built. It's really just feasibility if something could be built. So, removing a site from a technical a technical report, I don't think would be the right thing to do. Councillor Ball. Can, can we just note it as opposed to? I think it's probably better to receive a note at this present. It is just simply a receiving note. It's not seeking the council's endorsement for any sites or to take any action. Can, well, can I ask a further question then? Um, the, the technical report is what, on what basis is it identifying Jubilee um, as a location for three hard court netball and basketball courts um, when the public has not? Why are we receiving a, a note in a report based on, I'm assuming, a report that nobody's seen? I haven't seen the Net Strata Jubilee Master Plan. And so, on what basis is this technical report um, recommending that location? Here I have to the director. I'll go to the director. So, Mr. Mayor, the um, the technical report was was um, put together on the basis of evaluating each of those sites. It did factor in whether there was a master plan or conceptual plans associated with those sites. Um, there's no, as I said before, there is no clear recommendation here to build anything anywhere. These are just rec well, they're, they're recognised sites that could facilitate that sort of facility. Um, bearing in mind also, um, we had two submission two submissions from St George Basketball and St George Netball, both indicating those um, those sites as well. So that's what I include in the evaluation. Um, so just a further question: So councils have been asked to um, receive a note, a technical report that is. Excuse me, it, can sorry, Councillor Lou. Councillor Kajowski, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, councillors uh, being asked to receive a note or report which is informed by a master plan that we are not informed of. So how can I receive a note, a technical report based on information I am not aware of? So I'm not informed of the contents of the master plan and so how can I be informed on this technical report? That's a question, uh, Director, if you could answer that. Uh, Mr Mayor, I'm, I'm not aware. So the master plan hasn't been distributed to councillors at this stage. Yeah. Okay. So I think we did commit to distributing a um, a copy of that master plan about a month ago, actually. So I apologise for that. Well, I'll just allow the councillor to uh, actually ask the question. Well, so based on um, based on having not had that information, I would request we defer this motion we're not fully informed on, on what informed the technical report. Excuse me.
Sorry. Just, just, no, I'm, I'm waiting. Just try to Yes, or the green, whatever. Yeah, sorry. Just wanted to again say this has got nothing to do with master plans. In fact, there's no master plan for Talawai Reserve either. No. And in that. fact, and in fact, I'm not sure how many of the councillors have actually been to Talawai Reserve. I've been there numerous occasions, and I'll be very surprised when push comes to shove if this council or any future council builds on Tallawalla Reserve and I'm happy to uh, yeah I'm happy to state quite clearly why if anyone as I say is aware of where Tallawalla Reserve is uh, because the neighbours down there would be horrified uh, I do believe but that's just a personal opinion but again there's no master plan for that there is a master plan for Johnny Warren Centre but at this stage I'll be very surprised that Ray Barbie will be upset with me saying this but I'll be very surprised if in the short term we actually build on the Johnny Warren Centre either, even though that would be a very good use of council finances in the short term. But until we solve certain issues with Sydney Water and their uh, uh, insistence on an easement, there's going to be great difficulty there as well. But the reality is they are issues that are looked at in this technical report that has already been written. It's already been written. We can't change what's in the report. And as again, I reiterate, this recommendation, which was to receive a note in the original uh, assets uh, committee meeting, was all about receiving a report. It wasn't about building at Tallawalla, otherwise I'd be pulling that out. It wasn't about building at the Johnny Warren Centre, it wasn't about building at Net Strike. It was about looking at those options. And councillors who were here previously would well remember, I'm sure Councillor O'Meara and Councillor Lansbury do, when Mr Barbie came, we actually put in a site at Kingsgrove off Commercial Road, which was on previous on land that was previously set aside as part of the M5 East Reserve and wasn't used. But council determined probably, I'd have to check with the director, but probably 12 months ago, that that site could be used. And that's why it, I assume, obviously wasn't included in this report. As I've said before, all we're doing is receiving a noting because the report has been written. We're not going to go and chop out pages that are in the report. In the future, we can determine if it ever comes to pass, and I'm not sure it ever will, but if it ever comes to pass, there's a proposal to build at Net Strata Jubilee for netball and basketball courts, then we can look at that at that time. And we don't even have to use the information that's in this report if we determine not to. But the reality is, no matter how you vote on this, the report has been written and you cannot, I'm sorry, go and burn books or change reports, they are, in fact, historical data. <coughs> Mr Mayor, I'm happy to address the Council while you continue if you like, or I'm happy to wait. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, look, councillors, I think Councillor Green has said most of what I was standing up to say, which is that all we're seeking to do here is to receive a notary report that's been written to put something in our record as a document that we've received. Now, I can understand perhaps there is some trepidation among some councillors because in past, some WAGs 
have taken a technical report which has said this thing is possible and they've heard of members of the public taking a document like that and going out to members of the public and saying this is what council wants to do now perish the thought that any member of the public might do that here it might see a report that says we can build something somewhere and then go and scare residents in an election campaign by saying we are going to do something so Certainly, you know, a report saying that a pool could be built in several locations is not the same as saying the pool will be built in several locations, simply highlighting that it's possible. So what we've got here is another report saying that something is possible in several locations and then putting it back in our hands to do that ourselves. So I just wanted to make it clear that just because we've got a report on the books that says we can do something doesn't mean we will. And despite the, the track record, I suppose, of people, various wags in our community of, of intentionally confusing those two things. So I'll leave it there. Uh, yes, I'd just like to um, respond to some comments from um, Councillor Green. Um, I think he said that, you know, the, about Talawara Reserve, that you'd think residents would be horrified if you proposed to build um, basketball netball courts there. Well, I, I would say the same about the residents who live around Cogger Park and Jubilee, that they would quite likely also be horrified if, if there was a proposal to remove the park and build over it with netball and basketball courts. So, uh, Mr Mayor, I, I'd like to find a way, if we can, to receive a note report um, and acknowledge in that recommendation that Council, um, you know, doesn't recommend proceeding with um, one of the locations identified, which is the Net Strategy Plea. That's, that's what you're moving at the present moment. Can I that? Yep, sorry, Mr Mayor. That's not actually, I believe, available in this. We're just receiving and noting a report. We're not making any judgments on the issues raised. And I, again, I, I did, sorry, but if I didn't articulate it clearly enough, I accepted your arguments with regards to uh, Carlton. Uh, no, no discussion. That's, I don't believe that's the issue here at the moment. The issue is we have a report, we're receiving it, and it could sit, like many reports, um, in the library and never have anything done with it, but it is there as a historical record. Um, I have uh, another question. Um, Look, I will just, accept just... that motion, uh, Councillor Green. I think at this point in time, um, I can understand and the basis for my acceptance of that motion is that there is a report. The report has basically identified three areas where uh, basketball can happen. And those three years of Tullawalla, of Jubilee Park, and um, uh, Jubilee Park, and uh, Pensa. Yeah. Uh, I think at this stage, I think at this stage, it stands to reason that um, the report stands on its own. It's given various feasibility statements, and at the same time, what the Council of Borg is saying, I'm happy to accept that those reports exist. I'm happy to accept that feasibility studies exist, but what Councillor Borg is saying, I want you to support me in refocusing, refocusing our attention on just Tullawalla and um, Penso's Park. And on that basis, it's just a refocus it's basically a refocus on that basis. I will accept it. And if someone can, if someone believes it's an illegal motion, they can fight that in another arena. So that, do I have a second? Sorry? You're seconding? Oh, you're already seconded. So the, it can't be, the motion can't be like that. Uh, the motion has to be the council receive a note, the feasibilities of wherever they are in the council report. Uh, council is to own, is to only focus on Talawala and Chances. If that's the case, and there has to be a two-part motion moved. Or oh, two-part motion, then I'm happy for it to be two-part motion. And part B would be. And if we get 150 million from the state government, we'll put the put the uh, council. Is, let me put it quite bluntly. The, pur the purpose of this whole thing is to actually look at what the council officers have provided us. The council officers have provided us with a number of feasibilities and they've come up with three places. The three places, as we said, we've nominated before, includes Jubilee Park. 
I have no doubt if we get 50, 60, 70, 80 million dollars in the future, that we'll put another motion to the council saying we want some basketball courts and that it's up to the council to decide if it goes to Jubilee Park. At this point in time, what Councillor Borg is saying, I'm happy with what you've put to us in terms of feasibilities, but at this point in time, I only want to go forward, or we only want to go forward with two places, not Jubilee. So I, 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 I'll put it to the director. Director, you can put it in two, two, two ways, if you like, A and B. The council receive a note to record. The council excludes... The, no, I don't think it can council exclude. I think we need to say council. The council, uh, the council has uh, determined only to focus on Talawala and the yeah, Pensers Park. That's it. At this stage, to only focus on Talawala and Pensers Park. So not excluding Metstra. I think perhaps the best place to start would be with the original motion, then add a B to that, because yeah. I don't think the language in this one. Yeah, no, I think we need to go. To council use the first one as forward. use the original recommendation as A, and then the second recommendation, then the second, um, the, and then the second part under the original recommendation highlighting. Yeah. Council focus future. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Investigations around Tunnel yeah. Warren. Mr. Mayor, I'm happy to help out because it is getting late. Yeah. As Councillor Teg has indicated, stay with the first part. The council receiving that, et cetera, et cetera. And then B, the, the council has no intention at this stage of building at building a basketball slash netball facility at Net Strata Jubilee. Sorry, what was that? My proposal is that we just. Uh, so, so just, just for the benefit of the committee clerk, can we just grab the original um, recommendation from the committee, which was the whole of the whole one? The oh, Miss, can I again just to take Councillor Borg? I'm happy to go with it. And all right, so let's do it this way: the needs of both of us, well, and B, the council's primary focus at this stage will be the development of the Johnny Warren indoor stadium. And the telephone. No. no. Johnny, no. let's be serious. We're wasting our breath at Talawala, I'm telling you. Let's just no, 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 we're not wasting our breath because I can tell you, Councillor Elmira and myself had a meeting with them yep, and no, the no, director no. basically said Talawala right, was the place tell to focus. All right, do that. I always want to go home at some stage tonight. But yeah, the reality okay, is well, the residents want to go with it. Okay, so what have we got? Are you speaking against it? I just don't see the point of changing all this, to be honest with you, because... Well, look, I think we've got a motion, note, yeah. and then we get to a point that if we, if we get given this big check, for whatever reason, we can actually move them with what we want to do. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah but you're... And basically... Yeah. Don't worry. No, no, I'm not saying don't send us a check. If the council... No, no, I'm not saying don't send us a check. Let's make it clear. What I am saying is if we're taking it out of the equation at the present moment, but if we do get a check, then the the uh, director will bring back a report. Okay? So it's basically, anyway, look, I'm going to put the motion because I think at this stage we're wasting time over something uh, minor. What have we got? Mr. Mayor, as, as you were referring to, the, uh, the, the council... His primary focus be Johnny Warren indoor as uh, I've been and I think you need to put Talawala because we discussed this with these people and they wanted Talawala. Well, if the residents don't want it, they can knock it back. See, that's that's why, Mr. Mayor, I want to I want to again reiterate the point that rather than going down this path where you. You're literally opening a hornet's. You're kicking a hornet's nest. Just receive a note and report. It, it. You are not doing anything further beyond receiving the report. So, 
Well, I think that council, you're basically trying to move an amendment saying receive an open report. Of course, council of Borg support that. Do you accept that? No, the one that Councillor Lee said, receive an open report. No. Okay, so let's not waste any more time, Council. I'll foreshadow that motion. Sorry? I'll foreshadow the motion. Receive a note. Okay, receive a note. Thank you. Council of Mayors. Mr Mayor, I just wanted to make a suggestion, if I could. Sorry, can, I, can we all be quiet for a minute? I just wanted to make a suggestion that, you know, Part A, which is the original Part A, and Part B just read something like the Council notes that the preferred locations are Tullawarra and Penshurst. Something so like what? that. The preferred locations for the new facility are Tullawarra and Penshurst, whatever the correct oh, names are. Well, I don't know. That's up to Councillor Borg if she wants to accept that. All right. Well, if you're happy to accept that, let's change that and let's just keep moving. Yeah. Okay. All right. And what is it? That the count. Council, not council's primary focus, but the part B is to read the um, the preferred focus. What was that council Preferred sites, I said. It's not written yet. The council's preferred sites. Uh, uh, that the uh, Johnny Warren Indoor and and Tullawalla Reserve. You can leave that for for use as basketball netball centre to accommodate the needs of That's fine. Are you happy with that, Council? Yes, okay, well, I'm going to put it. No, I'm going to put it. You haven't done any community consultation. How you prefer any sites without doing community consultation? Oh, uh, Council of Elmere, I'm going to put it, and if people don't like it, they can vote against it. Otherwise, we'll be here all night. We start from this I support. Okay, Mr. May. Council Board. Council Board. For the motion. Councillor Elmir. Against. Councillor Green. Against. Councillor Jamison. For. Councillor Kanjarski. Against. Councillor Lansbury. For. Councillor Liu. Councillor Marnie. For. Councillor Mort. Four. Councillor Smirley. Against. Councillor Stratocopoulos. Against. Councillor Sarnington. Four. Councillor Tate. Against. Councillor Wang. Four. Eight, four. Seven against. I declare the motion carried. Now let's get on to the answer. Uh, report of the Community and Culture. Councillor Lou. Oh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm happy to move it as it printed on the paper. Thank you. Thank you. You have a seconder. Council, a seconder by Councillor Konjowski. All these, those in favour, um, say aye. All those, aye. all those against, say no. I declare it carried. Um, the draft revised code of meeting practice, and please keep in mind, this is only going for an exhibition. Happy to move that, Mr Mayor. Yeah, uh, Councillor Bork moves it. Councillor Lansbury seconds it. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I will declare it carried. Applications, uh, oh yeah, applications pursuant to Council's ward discretionary fund for June 2022. Happy to move that one as well, Mr Mayor. And moved by Councillor Bork, seconded by Councillor Lansbury, oh, Councillor Symington, and push. It's the red, it's the red uh, buttons that I'll be calling. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I declare it carried. The remuneration tribunal was lost. Community strategic plan, the plan. Can I have a motion? I'm happy Council to move that. Board. Happy to move the motion. Second. Councillor, I'm looking for a light. Press your button. Thank you. That was Councillor Jamison. So I'm, I'll um, move by Councillor Borg, seconded by Councillor Jamison. Councillor, a bit used to using your buttons, please. Thank you. Report of outstanding. Oh, all those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I declare it carried. 
report of outstanding council resolutions. Yes, I'm happy to move that motion, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Borg, seconder. Okay. Councillor Jamison. Uh, Councillor Jamison, thank you. I'll, I'll put it. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. I declare it carried. Deferred report on, forget the superannuation, wildlife protection areas within no, the River. I think uh, annual conference, I think. Okay. Sorry? Annual conference. CCL, this note is a motion. What are we going to do? Local government. Okay, well, we've got the local government, New South Wales 2023 annual conference voting delegates, submission of motions. Councillor Ball. I'm happy to move the, the motion with the amendment of um, the names of the councillors who are wishing to be um, voting delegates at the conference. Um, I think there's eight confirmed, and Councillor Smirgley, just to confirm, yes, he's in. So we have nine, nine um, councillors confirmed. Um, and yes, I'm happy to put that motion. No. Uh, I'll put it. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. I declare it carried. Uh, now we've got wildlife protection. Okay. And we have a notice of motion here wildlife protection areas within the Georges River local government area. Did you want to talk to that council on money? I'll second that, Mr. Mayor. Seconded by. It was on. Try your life. It was on. Okay. It was on. I just want you to get into the practice. That's all. Thank you. It's on. Councillor Marty, did you want to talk to that? Yeah, just proved, Mr. Mayor. Um, in April, Council resolved to exhibit the draft George River Wildlife Protection Area policy for 28 days. Council also declared various council managed parks and reserves category two wildlife protection areas under the Companions and Companion Animals Act. Effectively, the motion ban cats and off-leash dogs from nominated sites and protected the resident wildlife. Um, as there is a considerable amount of state government owned land in our LGA, which is also home to native wildlife, I'm asking for the government to identify whether those properties could also fall into that category so that those animals can enjoy a, can enjoy a similar level of protection. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor did you want to talk to that? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour say aye. aye. All aye. those against say no. Declare it carried. Again. Sydney Dogs and Cats, Councillor Tech. I've got my light on. Now hold on. Councillor Tech. And Councillor Tech, it's seconded by Councillor Tech. Excuse me, mine's on. Moved by Councillor Tech. I moved the motion standing in my name. Got to get your red lights on. I'm just going to have my light on. Okay, Councillor Tech, did you want to speak to I'm just going to move the motion standing in my name. Yeah, so it's, it's moved by Councillor Ted, seconded by Councillor Lansbury. All those in favour say aye. aye. Uh, uh, we, uh, all those against say no. Declare it carried. Uh, local government exit. George's Week Council Sports Advisory Committee. Sorry, Councillor Board. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I'd like to uh, move that motion. Um, and if I could have a seconder, I'll speak to her, please. Okay. Thank you, Council. Did you want to speak? Uh, yes, yeah, I didn't please. see who was seconded. Sorry. I've got a seconder, and it looks like they're battling to find out who's going to second it between Councillor Jamison and Councillor Lansbury. <laughs> so, could we please have a seconder? Okay. Uh, while you decide, I'll start talking. Um, Councillor. No. No. Sorry. We need to go no, I'm just no. I, I, I want to be. I want to be determined. Council lands three seconds. Thank you. Thank you, um, councillors. I ask for your support tonight on this motion, which is for council officers to prepare a report on the creation of the Georges River Sports Advisory Committee. Um, one of the objectives of establishing a sports advisory committee is to ensure that the leaders of all sporting organisations in our local government area have a voice into council, regardless of the knowledge of um, local government processes or decision making. Um, another objective is to provide a forum for sharing and disseminating information to the local community and to promote transparency in decision making. Um, it's also hoped that the Sports Committee will provide the opportunity for cross-code collaboration, which may lead to greater utilisation of facilities and fields in our local government area, 
which we all know there is a serious uh, shortage of. Um, the motion before you is for council officers to come back with a report, including a charter for the Sports Advisory Committee, which would outline the committee's authority in relation to, de to decision making, as well as the committee's term, membership, meeting schedule and reporting requirements. Um, the Sports Advisory Committee is in place in many other councils, and I think George's River Council and all of our sporting organisations could benefit greatly from its creation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Book. Councillor Angeli, did you want to talk about I'll put it. Can I, ask a quick, can I just ask a question? Yes, by all means. Sorry, just Councillor Hawke. So is this based on the former Hurstville Council Sports Advisory Committee? I have no knowledge of the former Hurstville Council Sports Advisory Committee, um, but I have liaised with the directors um, on what my vision is here, um, and they will come back to us with a, with a report on what they think, I guess, is the best formation for this uh, committee. Yeah, just that uh, Hurstville Council for about 30 years that I'm aware of had a sports advisory committee and that was uh, shut down about eight years ago from memory. And it was, it was a good opportunity. I mean, many times I didn't see it in this room, but with people like, you know, Council Lens, remember Doc Buckley from uh, St George Football Association who was there for years and Gordon Lowry and Laurie Fernley from uh, St George Junior Rugby League, and they got it that the council actually found uh, that they used to meet annually, and certainly Rockdale Council was that maybe the what you were looking at, what Rockdale Council used to do as well. I'm familiar with Randwick Council, who have it, and um, have been advised by one of their council officers that it works very successfully there, um, and so that was um, where the study started from. Okay. Yeah. As I say, just just confirm. You know, that'll be something for the council officers perhaps to look at because, as I say, it, they used to meet annually with the with the, the council. Uh, all the councillors used to come together and have that meeting with those uh, organisations. But I'm pleased to say that my knowledge uh, it's probably not as great as other people in this room, but my knowledge is that the local sporting bodies uh, tend to work very collaboratively uh, and. So whatever we can do that the system that'd be okay. good. Thank you, Councillor Green. Does anybody else want to say anything about it? No? Well, Councillor I will now. Sorry? I will speak to it now if that's okay. Um, just to sort of follow up from Councillor Green, I understand that the council officers do work really well with the sporting bodies. However, they're contacting us regularly as councillors and we just feel, we've discussed it a lot, I've discussed it with Director Ladder, I've discussed it with councillors from other councils um, and I understand that Bayside recently dissolved theirs because they finally moved away from committees of the whole to set committees, which I'm told by councillors is a retrograde step. They're not finding it a very productive thing for them to use. Well, I know from, in my experience as a councillor, Sporting groups are always coming to us when they've got issues, whether it's field upgrades, lighting issues, amenities, blocks, or the rest of it. We've always been sidelined on this term, last previous term of council, I should say, because they've been considered operational matters. And I think this council, um, the current council, has more of an appetite to be able to represent our groups in a committee format rather than just having to be hands off and, and have everything dealt with in an operational way. And I, I think my discussions with Director Ladder here was quite open to that. And, you know, let's have a report come back to us to see where we go from there. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor, you had... I was asked a question previously. I'm just going to be asked a question. No, no, I asked a question. Now I'm going to make a comment. And I agree with Councillor Lansbury that there is good uh, work with our council staff. And if you look at the work that has taken place uh, over the last uh, five years in terms of upgrades of facilities, it has been absolutely phenomenal. And in fact, Councillor Lansbury referred to part of that early this evening when she was talking about Charlie Peary Reserve. And you, you look at the work that's taken place there, you look at the work that's taken place at Clayton Reserve, you look at the work at Renown Park, you look at the work at the eight fields at Gannon's Park, you look at the work that took place in the three fields at Beverly Hills Park, and that's just in terms of field surfaces. There has been considerable improvement, and in fact, it was only last year I commented uh, on the uh, feedback that uh, the former Premier of New South Wales, Maurice Yemmer, provided to this council on, uh, remember, you will re well remember, Mr. Mayor, uh, the comments from those who came from Taramurra saying how they couldn't believe 
the quality of the, the ground surfaces in this council area compared to theirs on the lower North Shore. And in fact, you'd also remember, Mr Mayor, uh, the comments made last year when, as uh, so early this year, uh, when uh, Cricket New South Wales chose a Gannon's Park, which as we know, uh, for years was regarded as a dump because it had been that, uh, was chosen to actually host the state finals uh, thanks to the recommendation of former Premier Yemma uh, for those facilities to be used because of the ground surface. So I think uh, the work of our council staff uh, operationally over the last five years has indeed been phenomenal and uh, I'll concur with Council Ansbury in that regard. And uh, anything we can do to assist in the upgrades of our parks, our sporting amenities, our facilities is something that our community will benefit from and indeed be very grateful for. Thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, uh, Councillor Wayne, yes. Yeah, yeah, can I ask a question? So for, for this committee, uh, who were who is the members? Uh, maybe down the track, but I just want to know, is the staff or the... I, I, I know, but, um, you know, so at the, at the base, you have some idea, right? So who will be the... Uh, the I'll, I'll get the director, uh, the general manager. It's from the committee. Through, through you, Mr. Mayor. These yeah. are some of the things that we have to investigate. Uh, Councillor Borg mentioned yeah. Randwick. We're going to have a look at Randwick Star Sports Council and their, how they form that sports council, and we'll look at other councils where they're at. But at this stage, I couldn't tell you who the membership will be, uh, but that will be all part of the report that will come back to council. Okay, cool, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Director. Uh, General Manager. Um, then th that, I'll put it. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those against say no. I declare it carried unanimously, and we will now go to Congratulations by uh, Councillor Green to the recipients of no, the clips. No, it's me. Oh, sorry, Councillor Simonton. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Thank you, Councillor Simonton. Sorry. Okay, fair enough. Councillor Simonton. Um, yeah, we got a second. Oh, uh, second, seconder is uh, Councillor. No, uh, the mayor would like a red light, Councillor. Take. So, okay, Councillor Kanjowski. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, um, I move my motion as read. Councillors, um, the Lower Fulton Project is a prime example of the outstanding outcomes that council officers are achieving for our local government area. And last year, before the um, previous council term ended, councillors were invited to take a tour of the nearly completed works. And I took up that offer along with Councillor Green and um, uh, former Councillor Greckis. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, if there are any other councillors from that term that. that that went, but that's who I remember. Um, I was really impressed um, with the design and the thought that had um, gone into the project and felt very proud of the team that was responsible. So it didn't come as a surprise to me at all that the project was awarded the Asset Infrastructure Award for Excellence. Um, it was so well deserving. Uh, the prime focus, I'm going to give you a little bit of history here, the prime focus was to remediate the old depot site, providing connectivity to the green corridors. A key element of the project, which was so impressive, that's what, like, when I looked at it, that's what I was so impressed about, was to reuse site objects which were repurposed to provide natural urban habitat refuges for our native fauna population, threatened by habitat losses and um, feral animals. Um, there are bat caves that are made from large concrete tanks that were repurposed to create homes for our micro bat population, a safe and dark environment during the day. There are bee hotels built using reclaimed bricks like good hotels that have been built close to bars, eateries and fun attractions. This is so important because native bees are an essential pollinator and ensure the health of our bushland. Then we have bird purchases, perches, which were made um, from recycled posts and small branch, branches found, found on site. Rock shelves, hollow logs and boulder fields um, were built from stormwater pipes, sections of the former depot concrete slab and leftover sandstone to native reptiles and other invertebrate have a safe place to rest. Um, First Nations artist um, Danielle Mate was commissioned to, to design contemporary artwork for the walls of the new habitat refuges. Um, and additionally, a new car park 
um, was also constructed to um, serve the playing field. Um, then we go to the community and culture team who also put in a stellar effort developing the Safe Community Events Program. It reduced community isolation. Residents could gather safely and these events supported our local economy, um, which was so desperately needed. There were new ways, innovative ways that were developed that could activate our town centres. And I think these new ideas were such a success that they're here to stay. I'm a little bit biased because I think George's River Council should have won that category. And it contained Uncontained, um, In Good Taste, Little Luna, Pop-Up Drive-Ins, the Eurovision Song Contest, all developed as COVID-19 COVID safe events. I attended um, Uncontained um, last Friday and it was fantastic. The community has embraced these new events and our local government area can only benefit. On Congratulations to all the council officers that worked so hard. And I, um, I'm so glad that your outstanding work and efforts was um, recognised. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Simonton. Did anyone want to speak to that? Uh, Councillor Finjowski? Uh, yes, I just want to say congratulations to staff. There's more great work from our officers and um, council staff. And um, I've been down to Fulton Park on at least a dozen occasions, uh, walked around um, that bottom end of Fulton Park where they've done all that um, work that uh, Councillor Symington commented on before. And I suggest that if, not, if you haven't been, go down and have a look. It is just excellent. Well Thank done. you, Councillor Konjowski. I'll put that. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. Declare it carried unanimously. Now we go to the congratulations of the... Thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, thank you. I'll turn this off so someone can second. So, <laughs> thank you. That was uh, seconded by Councillor T. Thank you, Councillor Omir. I hope, Councillor Omir, you'll accept a minor amendment that I'd like to make, and that is in the first line where I'd like you to actually read that the Council congratulates and the Mayor writes to the local recipients, etc. Thank you. Do you happen to do That's that? Councillor T. That's the recipient. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, Councillor Lee. No, it's too late. You've been sunk. It's too late. It's Councillor T. Keep going, Councillor uh, Yeah, Councillors, it's, uh, it's self-evident. I'd just like to quickly comment on the contributions, and I'll start with Mohammed Hajj, uh, who is, uh, I believe, only 41 years of age, but he's made a significant uh, contribution. In fact, one uh, 2017 uh, Premier's Multicultural Community uh, Medal for his uh, involved in this uh, economic uh, participation and particularly his work in uh, building relations uh, between Australia and the Gulf community and building uh, business links uh, for, the, for New South Wales. He's got an extensive uh, and highly regarded uh, credentials in uh, economics and uh, we congratulate him on the work that he's done particularly in uh, providing investment opportunities, as I say, uh, for the local business community. And uh, again, his uh, OAM is recognition of this. Uh, Dr. Lou McGuigan, many of you, of course, would like myself know Lou very well, uh, has been a, a major contributor at St George Hospital uh, for many years, uh, a Penshurst resident originally, and uh, uh, sadly uh, lost his wife a number of years ago. Uh, but uh, great. Uh, contributor to the community and certainly in medical spheres uh, is so highly regarded, hence his award of an AM in these recent awards. And most importantly, of course, in Lou's case, someone you'll always see at, uh, at Net Strata Jubilee for a Dragons game because he's a very solid uh, supporter of the Dragons. And of course, uh, we have an AO awarded to uh, Robert McClellan. We all know uh, Robert. Uh, I first met Robert back in about 1987-88 when I was chairing the Hurstville Council um, uh, Centenary and then Bicentenary uh, Sports Committee and Robert came on that committee to offer us uh, some assistance way back then but of course uh, moved uh, through his extensive uh, legal experience uh, into federal parliament uh, taking, uh, taking over from uh, Gary Punch as the member for Barton uh, becoming Australia's Attorney General and now, of course, a distinguished member of the judiciary. And uh, he has been recognised, as I say, for his contributions to the law and social justice, law reform, and most importantly, I think, his service to this local community. I would, however, uh, state 
as I've said to Robert already, uh, he still hasn't caught his father, uh, the great man Doug, who in fact received an AC uh, many years ago. What a distinguished family uh, councillors, uh, the McClellans, and I won't go through all the service provided by that wonderful family in congratulating Robert, in congratulating Lou, and congratulating Mohammed. And I'm sure, Mr Mayor, you'll uh, uh, take great will, pride in that. writing yeah. those congratulatory letters. Thank you, councillors. Thank you, councillor. Just a, only very briefly, Mr Mayor, I just rise in particular um, to give my personal um, vote of thanks to Robin McClellan. Um, thanks to um, a decision he made back in 1997, played a pretty big role in, in me being here today. I did my year 10 work experience in his office um, very, very long ago now. And um, yes, yeah, set me on the path and, and helped uh, fan the flames with my interest in community service. So a uh, personal vote of thanks from me to him and certainly very worthy recipient. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. And I endorse those comments made by Councillor Green and Councillor Tig. Um, I will put it. All those in favour say aye. Aye, aye. All those against say no. I declare the, hour, uh, the ayes have it and um, uh, declare it carried. Um, banning, oh no, now we've got questions on notice and I will only take questions, further questions on any of your questions. That's a question. Mr. I'll, I'll move that we receive a note for the responses. That's no, what we do. No, we don't do that. Taking it. There is no motion. Councillor, do you have a question? Yeah, I had a question for my question of notice for Mortdale Master Plan. But I don't know if Meryl's here. Should we just, should I just ask the question? Yeah, oh, you're online. Oh, coffee. Um, so I just had a couple of questions. The first one, I just want to verify that if you don't have a master plan and restoring a master plan will basically mean there'll be ad hoc development. Uh, as a director. Sorry, I've got heaps of questions for you, Mel, sorry. Uh, can you hear me, councillors? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the question is that if we don't have a master plan, sorry, the volume's not very good. If we don't have a master plan, there will be ad hoc development that would occur within the Mortdale area. That was... Yeah, just confirming. That's, That's the question. It's all, yeah. So, as as the councillors are aware, uh, a planning proposal can be lodged for any site within the city. And, of course, the planning proposal is looked at in relation to its strategic merit and, of course, in its site-specific merit. So, in relation to its strategic merit, it would look at there would be the local strategic planning statement, the housing strategy, and if there was a master plan, a master plan would be looked at to guide that development. But in the void of a master plan, um, there are other strategic documents that that the staff or any review would have a look at, and that would be the local strategic planning statement, and it would be the housing strategy. Okay, um, and it's just so I know, Mas, how long have master plans and the whole process been around for? Is that new or that's been around for 30 years? Uh, is when, yeah. So when precinct planning is done, so whether it's for uh, a, a larger site or an area, uh, master planning work is done because master planning allows a number of things to be looked at to guide how the future of that precinct might work. So that's everything from urban design aspects that looks at the built form, which is the height and the floor space. It's public domain improvements. It's how the, lo uh, the local street network works. Uh, it also looks at uh, financial viability of, of what is being proposed in the master plan. So it, it has a number of elements and of course that then if that master plan is endorsed as a strategic document, it then forms the basis of a planning proposal and then that journey begins. So it's how long has it been in council for like the concept of master plan since day dot or I'd say is it 20 years? Um, I, I, Councillor Jamison, I won't comment for the former Hurstville Council or for the former Concord Council. But ever since uh, it's been George's River Council, with me being in place since October 2016, when we have done work within our town centres, we have done master planning work or an urban design study. So, 
So let's say for the last five years. Okay. Um, one of the questions that our speaker had is why is it taking so long after, as I was in the council award meeting, that we had um, a year that was a, a timetable that was a lot shorter. And if we don't do it, are we at risk? How, how much time do we have? Uh, I think to be fair to my staff and I, we have followed a journey with the preparation of the master plan that has been going on for uh, 18 months. Uh, we have been with the new council, we have, and the, the comments that came back from the community, which were substantial towards the end of last year, it takes us a bit of time to come back to you with options that work. So the timetable that's in the report is a realistic in in the question with notice is a realistic time time frame. We will come back to you in August to have a workshop to discuss some options, and then once at that workshop, we'll work with you regarding a way forward. But as I say, it's not something that we can come back to you within two weeks. It takes a bit of time for us to digest what the community has told us, how we how we deal and also how we deal with the strategic vision of the city that has been set by the LSPS. But I a, 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 a workshop has been set down to discuss the options with you um, in mid August. So um, the question that follows on, are we at risk of having um, development put like uh, at what time does the previous Mortdown master plan no longer exists. Is there a point where we're at the, risk? The draft, the draft plan is there in place. So let's just say, I, I'm assuming you're talking about the RSL planning proposal, are you? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. So. Uh, sorry, councillors. Now that that subject's been raised, I will leave the room. Oh, sorry. The. Provisions that are set by the department allows an, a proponent who's lodged a planning proposal to, look, to lodge a review within 90 days of that application being lodged. So a zoning review can be lodged where they where the, the council hasn't determined it, determined it where the council has refused it, or where the council has uh, taken too much time to lodge it for a gateway once uh, once it has been endorsed. So the RSL has been within council for well over a year now. They could lodge a review at any stage. So does the previous Mortdale RSL hold or the draft, the current draft Mortdale master plan hold? If it may be a matter, let's let's just say they lodge a review. It may be a matter that the department would take into account as part of looking at the strategic merit of, of the centre. Yes, they may do. They may do. So um, the other thing is affordable housing. Um, we currently have incentives um, where we buy a floor space with current with the current step system. So are, are we still going to be focusing on um, maybe it's uh, on focusing trying to solve the affordable housing with the Mortdown in high rise development? I guess that's that, is, right. that is a matter that I'll discuss with you at the next workshop. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jemison. Does anybody have any questions on their questions in the uh, business paper? Okay. Well, now we've no, got. I've got a question on. No, a Councillor. Yeah, please. I've got a question on the street signs replacement program. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the director later. Um, I just wanted to know how the suburbs will be prioritised in the stage program. Um, Mr Mayor, there has been no determination as to how we're actually going to prioritise at this stage. So what we've um, what we've been doing is collecting the data. Um, what the plan would be is we'll come back to um, Council with, with a proposed plan. Um, my um, personal opinion on it would be that we start with the larger um, town centres and sort of work out radially from, from there. Um, but which town centre we start in, that's the one for, I think, um, higher powers. Hi. Thank you. Could we actually get Kevin to come back in, please, Councillor Green? Someone, yeah. 
Uh, any further questions on the um, <laughs> I'm going to give a five minute break soon. So <laughs> but, uh, uh, yes, thank you, councillors. Um, there, there being no further questions on the questions on notice, uh, we'll now go to the confidential matter, which is Hurstville. But uh, Hurstville over. Good night. Good night. <laughs> okay. And uh, I think we can go into confidential now. We'll need a motion to go into confidential. I so move, Mr. Mayor. Moved by Councillor Tech, seconded by Councillor. Uh, Councillor Symington, all those in favour say aye, all those against say no, I declare it carried and I declare we have another five minute break while we're getting used to the fact that Okay, welcome councillors, welcome back and this is the open session. Councillor Symington, you are moving the recommendation as it appears in the um, uh, in the confidential report which is that which is indicated i think we actually need to put the recommendation up yeah just take the amounts of money out and move the rec and so that the hospital over community project oh do what about increase as a result of the project okay so what we need is the Hurstville Rural Community Pavilion project budget be increased as a result of the project variation to the existing contract associated with construction of material increases. Sorry? The seconder was Councillor T. I haven't said I've, I've moved that, thank you. Yeah, Councillor, thank Councillor you. Symington has moved that way. Oh. Councillor T has seconded. Um, and it's all the rest of it, which I think that's fine. So, yeah. Um, councillors, did anyone want to talk to this? No. Okay, so I'll put it. All those in favour, uh, raise your hands. Uh, Councillor Mort. Councillor Mort. Hello. Raise your hands if you're if you're in favour. Okay, um, and and the two councillors, your councillor Marty is against it. Councillor Org is <coughs> abstained. Okay, so I'll put that. I've done it. We put it. I declare the motion carried. The meeting closed at uh, ten thirty-eight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, councillors. I appreciate.